Hello. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Can you all hear me? Can you hear the the sultry sound of my voice? <laughs> Is this the Krusty Krab? Yeah, 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 yeah. Phone guy. Phone guy. Hello, hello. <laughs> um, in true fashion, uh, like, like I mentioned before that the landscapers were showing up to like blow leaves around and mow the lawn on Mondays. So that was great. And so I was like, I'll do a Sunday one. And apparently they changed their schedule. So now they're doing Sunday too. <laughs> so if you hear any blowing noises, it's just the landscapers taking care of the apartment. <laughs> Happy birthday, Meme Saw Studio. Happy birthday. <laughs> okay, so um, I've, I've decided I've, I've done a thing. We're still on the starting screen, so I've done a thing. I uh, I decided I was ready to change some things up. I wanted a bit of a, a new look. I wanted a bit of a new design. Um, something real subtle. You know, honestly, if I didn't mention it, you all probably wouldn't even notice anything was different. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I, I've been excited to show this new look to you all. I saw Orange Abyss in chat earlier. I can't wait for the fan art because Orange Abyss is always on top of that. <laughs> um, so yeah, let me just, it's its a nice subtle new look. I'm sure you'll all, you, you wouldn't even notice. Um, this is what I look like now. <laughs> it's, this is me. <laughs> Aren't, is, aren't I beautiful? Look how gosh dang beautiful I look now. <laughs> I've been, I'm so happy with how this turned out. <laughs> like, like, oh my gosh. This is, it's perfect. It's exactly what I wanted it to be. And I'm amazing. <laughs> What's the lore explanation? Thank you, Mr. E in the morning. I knew someone was going to ask. So basically, this is my gremlin mode. Like, like, on full moons, in the dark, dead of night, in the pumpkin patch, sometimes I just transform into gremlin mode, and that this is this. <laughs> Thanks, Wild Pilot! 24 hours till the AMV reviews! Yeah! yeah heck yeah! I'm so excited! Tomorrow's gonna be a crazy day! I can't wait for all the people who, who will show up for the AMV reviews who missed this! Uh, new outfit reveal, and they'll all be like, when did this happen? <laughs> when, when did this become your design? <laughs> all right. The chat is slow. Ah, might just be... I might have tactical difficulties today. Who knows? <laughs> all right. So, yay! Yay! New design! Yeah! Yeah! <laughs> All right. Yeah, pretend like nothing's ever. It's like, yeah, she's always looked this way. What are you talking about? <laughs> nothing's changed. You're talking crazy. <laughs> All right. So, volume four. We're here with volume four. Uh, bam. Oh, yeah, that's right. I forgot to tell you. Now that I have this new look, I need new floaty buddies to hang out with me, too. Um... So like like Lumpkin and Hampkin, the little leafy green monkey guy, and Pumpkin Seed ham Hamster, they still exist. But now we also have new friends as well. Uh, this is Flumbo. <laughs> Flumbo is a design I came up with like a year ago, a year and a half ago or something. I came up with this creature for no reason. I just wanted a creature to be my little doodle friend, and Flumbo's design matched this idea very well. <laughs> <laughs> and then also we have this new creature, which I've been calling Peekaboo. Um, new outfits mean new new animal friends as well. <laughs> so yes, scrunklies. Yes, <laughs> yes, baddie. <laughs> we get we got our scrunkly little floaty buddies who will hang out with us. And it looks like dark matter from Kirby. Thank you. That is a huge compliment. <laughs> that dark matter. A lot of Kirby bosses. Fuel my creativity. A lot of Kirby in general, like, is huge inspirations for me. <laughs> yes, peekaboo. <laughs> so this is this is the squad. This is the squad. <laughs> and now we are all together 
and we can all hang out and watch Ruby together. All, all of us. Me, my little floaty buddies, and you together. I'm also doing something different. You'll notice my little hidey screen that hides the, uh, the footage so, so copyright strikes don't happen. I've changed it. It's a different design now. And also, to really push the subtlety <laughs> of, of you maybe subscribing, liking, and leaving a comment if you like this stuff. Just, just really, really being subtle with it. <laughs> but also, I'm, I'm gonna play around with lowering their opacity a little bit. Because even once I'm done with this Ruby stuff, I do want to uh, keep doing um, reaction, like watch along streams and everything. I already know a couple of things I wanna, I wanna potentially watch. I'm thinking about watching Hell of a Boss later. That'll be, that could be fun to watch with you all. And I'm torn between, um, Owl House, Arcane, and the Dragon Prince. So I might have a poll and I might have everyone vote on the poll for what else they want me to, to watch along with me first. So, <laughs> um, but first we gotta go through Ruby. We're on volume four today. We've already watched the first two episodes. So if you, uh, if you've missed it, we're on the, we're on the episode three now. Um, I skipped the Tide Pod commercial in the beginning. <laughs> but don't worry, we'll get more Tide Pod commercials. <laughs> don't you worry. <laughs> All right. Okie dokie. So, let's, um, yeah, let's dive in to volume four. Because if you remember where we left off last time, have I seen the Adams Family? Like, which one? The answer is going to be yes, but which one are you specifically referring to? Like, uh, I watched the old school one back in the day, like the one from the 60s, I think it is. I watched uh, Wednesday. I made a review for Wednesday, so, and if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. I think it's a, one of my funnier reviews. The tide must flow. Yes. <laughs> and don't forget to grab your beverages to keep you uh, hydrated and beveraged. I definitely, I had captions on. I had them on throughout the whole opening. Ooh, Rooster Teeth's website. Why, why are, are, is your company shutting down with quality like this? <laughs> Here, let me try refreshing the page. I knew this was gonna happen. I, if you le stay paused on a screen on Rooster Teeth's website for a little too long, it just like forgets what it's supposed to be doing. Like if you have captions on, it'll just forget. The It'll like load weird and whatever. <laughs> So, sorry, I'm doing my best. Rooster Teeth needs to step up their game. <laughs> also, there's this, there's a banner on the top. Uh, it's just out of view, where from what you guys can see. But it's, it's a little banner advertising the Rooster Teeth store. And all it says is Rooster Teeth store, and then a couple of images of their items. And then it says, <laughs> all sales final, no returns. <laughs> Which, if that's not a, a resounding, <laughs> a resounding, we're shutting down, <laughs> then I don't know what is. <laughs> English subtitles, please. Thank you, furry giraffe. Blake's outfit, Blake's outfit, yeah. I, 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 where we left off, I was already ranting about her outfit, and I am ready to rant even more. So I released the short about me talking about her design. And I already talked about it in last stream, but yeah, like this should have been a casual design. And, and I understand like the idea of like maybe wearing, like this is battle ready and it makes sense that when she's on the boat for it to be battle ready, you know, she does end up running into the sea Feilong and having to fight it. So, you know, when you're traveling, the battle readiness of it is fine. But once she lands on Menagerie, with a moment her and Sun are sitting down sipping tea with Gira and Kali, she should have taken the coat off and worn something more casual, you know? <laughs> Especially her boots. Like, you can't- you, it's really hard to see in the show. Thank you, Danny boy. Bummed I'm gonna have to miss one of the streams because I'll be working. However, it's the volume 5 stream, so I'm not too bummed out about it. Yeah, I know. <laughs> volume 5 
Woof. It's it's the, such the darkest before the dawn. I'll talk about volume five here in a sec, but um, finishing my thought about Plague's outfit. Her shoes, it's hard to see with how the scenes are lit in engine, but they're so ludicrously, like, shielded like they're two layers of like boot armor on Blake's thigh high high heel stripper armor battle boots and it's befuddling <laughs> it's so not casual and it doesn't even match anything else Blake has worn I think that's the biggest thing is her outfit in this volume feels so disconnected from both of the two outfits she wore previously. Because her style has always been kind of sleek, simple, minimalistic, you know, things like that. Like her regular t-shirt and pants with like her fashionable butt cape for volume two. You know, like her normal volume one outfit is just a kind of normal outfit anybody could wear. It's just like slightly elevated. So for her to jump for this volume, into wearing a huge intricate coat and all these intricate little bits and bobs and layers. Something is, Monty used to like look at real fashion when designing characters, and I highly recommend you do if you're stuck on how to come up with an interesting design. Look at real fashion to help you figure it out. And I get the feeling no one thought about fashion when designing these volume four outfits. I think Ayn Lee designed them I think Ayn Lee designed everyone's outfits uh, after Monty passed. And I don't... It just... It, it just doesn't... I don't think it quite works. I don't think... Blake especially never quite works. The white is always way too much. It's not a very flattering outfit. Ugh. Even, like, the artwork is done in a pretty way. But even then, it's just... It's, it's a lot for no good reason. Like, billowy and flowy and very cumbersome. I feel like you just get in Blake's way all the time. <laughs> but whatever. <laughs> um, And it does look too warm for a menagerie. Like, like it's a tropical island. And I, I can understand if like they weren't sure what Blake was going to be doing. But they, in the, in the intro for this volume, she's in the desert with fighting an illusion of Adam, but that never happens in the volume. So I'm left to theorize that initially there might have been early ideas for Blake to fight Adam in the deserts of Menagerie. Because Menagerie is said to have like really crazy dangerous deserts on it, even though we never see it. <laughs> the only thing we have ever seen of Menagerie is Kuokuana. I think that's how you pronounce it. That's that's the name of the town. It's so easy to forget that's not what all of Menagerie looks like. So, but clearly the idea was like she'd be in a hot environment, whether it's Menagerie the island or the deserts of Menagerie. Why would you put her in a huge coat and like stripper boots? It just doesn't make any sense. It's not a good design. <laughs> it's uh, I'll, uh, Blake and Yang's designs are so... Like, Ruby's is fine. It has its problems. Like, all the belts and the boob window, which not only just doesn't make sense for, like, traveling the world, but, you know, she watched Pyrrha get shot in the boobs and died. <laughs> Why would Ruby also wear a boob window? But but Blake and Yang's especially. I just get the feeling that Ayn Lee didn't really know what to do with their outfits. Especially because they're kind of similar, with the too long sleeves, the too much busy work going on on their tops, the, like, oversized, like, cape, like, coattail elements. Yang's comes off, which I guess is fine, but why even include them if you're just gonna take them off? <laughs> this whole plot point, with Sun, like, creeping on Blake, a lot of people who are, uh, anti- Sun x Blake will use this as an excuse that, like, Sun is a creeper stalker. And I'm like, that's... I, they were trying to go for something comedic. They failed. But they were trying. <laughs> so they were... I, it just doesn't make sense. Like, in-universe. Like, you could tell they thought of the joke of Sun dives in. Wow, thank you, Ranger. Ranger J04. Thank you so much. One thing that irks me about her coats, this in Volume 7, is that it looks really hard to move in if she ever zips it up. Yeah, 
Like, yes. <laughs> yes, especially. Like, her volume 7 one, I think, is even worse. It looks so skin tight, especially her arms, which you see has zippers and is also unzipped, but then rebelted shut. It's just like a ludicrous feeling. It just doesn't like like I, I if if you've ever cosplayed one of Blake's either volume four or volume seven outfits, let me know how it was because the Bla the, the coat element itself seems so cumbersome and uncomfortable. Especially because like this one's weird because there's like two elements to it. The coat tails is like completely separate from the front end. And it doesn't, it doesn't look comfortable. It looks, I don't think you could zip it up. Oh, what a great placement for this ad. <laughs> the middle of the fight scene. Let's, let's talk about Tide. <laughs> I, I just, I was, this is also, okay, okay, okay. Last night I was watching something else on on tv and or it was like uh, one of my streaming services i don't remember which one it was but all i got was tide commercials there too <laughs> it was like youtube all i got was tide commercials <laughs> i'm like why why are they haunting me <laughs> but uh yeah it's very seto kaiba and uh, like it's especially weird because seto kaiba has been notoriously mocked for his very goofy fashion choices and he makes that fashion choice because he wants to look like a blue eyes white dragon because he's actually a gigantic nerd. But everyone made fun of his coats for that. And so I don't understand why Ayn Lee, when designing this outfit, just leaned into an idea that most people were already making fun of with Kaiba. I don't, I don't get it. Um, yeah, Sun stalking Blake. I understand, you could tell, like, they sat there and thought of it, and they were like, ah, oh, yes, this will be a funny haha -ha gag, we'll paint it up like it's someone who might be a threat, maybe Adam, and no one will be fooled at all, <laughs> because Sun's in the opening, but we'll, maybe they'll think it's Adam, and then Sun will come in and will be like, what? What are you doing here? Golly gee, what a funny gag. And you can tell lots of times they will do things like that for what they think is the sake of a joke. Like in volume nine, when we eventually get there, the, uh, the moment where Blake and Weiss are like struggling to get her sword back from the vines. Weiss says, I can't help on you because I'm low on dust. And like that paints a very specific picture of like where they should be like like that sounds like a very big deal but it isn't it's just a thing they throw in there to excuse the sake of what is supposed to be a comedic moment but they don't think about how it actually affects the rest of the show around it like sun hiding from blake stalking her for presumably months now because like, it, it, it's been quite a bit of time since the fall of Beacon. Like, even if it was just, like, two weeks, you know? Like, it's been at least two weeks. He's been stalking her for two weeks, at least, just for the sake of that reveal joke. You know, if it, a writer would sit there and be like, Oh, that, that actually isn't good. <laughs> that, that joke alone doesn't justify that decision writing-wise. It doesn't make sense for Sun's character. It doesn't- it's not even a funny joke either. <laughs> like, he could have just been following her. He didn't need to be stalking her. Like, it, it makes no sense. <laughs> it makes no sense, and it retroactively makes him look like a, like, way scummier character because of it. <laughs> like, like, Blake's whole thing is, like, Adam stalks her across Anima, and that's a big deal. And so for Sun to do that, too, it just really paints Sun in this, like, horribly negative light. Sun gets turned into a real punching bag this volume, and it's such a shame. And like uh, I've been talking about the bees a lot over with uh, Team Jack on um on, on Tuesdays on Celtic Phoenix's channel, we've been going through the development of the bees over all the volumes. We're almost done. That's fun. But um, 
Yeah, like this is the volume where you can tell they're starting to really lean into the idea of it. You know? Like, uh... Like, like this is where like we start having lines of dialogue where we tease it a lot more. Where, where she talks about Yang... It's like with a w- little bit of a, 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 a qu- like waver in her voice, you know. It's it's really small here. It becomes much more apparent like with the volumes leading up to it. But I feel like they also, in an attempt to start to lean into Blake X Yang, they decided to turn Sun into this really big punching bag of a character where Blake is annoyed with him all the time. She slaps him constantly. He's seen as this, like, goof who doesn't know things and is a stupid idiot. And it's so weird. Like, people talk about, oh, they ruined Adam's character. But (laughs) Sun really got ruined. Like, he was a competent character before. But I did change. (laughs) Yes, Amber. (laughs) I've, I've... Aren't I pretty? <laughs> I think this is an awesome design. <laughs> but yeah, like like Sun Sun's whole character really takes a dive during this volume, and it's so crazy. He stays. He be, he's like a main character for basically two volumes here. Like he's a good. Like he's a major element at the end of volume one. He shows up for important moments in volumes two and three. But he's a main character. He's the only one with Blake the entire time. He's the one running around and fighting baddies with her. And it's so weird that they paint him as just this ignorant idiot. And also, like, they make it so Blake's always annoyed with him and always for really small things. Like, he's always trying his best. And she's just getting constantly pissed at him because he can't read her mind, I guess. <laughs> but it's weird. And also, all of that, and they didn't even change his design. <laughs> that that pisses me off. Like, the, the whole time he didn't get an outfit change, everyone got an outfit change. Everybody. They had to remodel his entire character in engine anyway. Like, you can't just take a poser file model and drop it into Maya and it all works exactly the same. They had to recreate his entire design and they- everyone else got an upgrade. Every single other character got a new outfit upgrade except for Sun. (laughs) It's- mm, mm. I guess Emerald and Mercury didn't get outfit upgrades either. Which is so weird. But then Emerald and Mercury eventually did when we got to Atlas. But then we see Sun and he still hasn't. (laughs) Mr. E in the morning. I've dealt with a person like that. She would tell me to do something, then get mad when I did it. I was expected to be a mind reader at all times. Oh my god. Oh my god. Sorry, I was fighting off the sneeze monster. <laughs> it, that is so... And when people get mad at you, I hate that. It's especially when they say, like, vague things. Like, if someone goes, hand me that over there, and I'm, like, looking in the direction of, quote-unquote, over there, and it's, like, a hundred different things, and I'm like, which one is that? And then they get mad at you for, like, needing clarification because they've failed at communicating. <laughs> Can't read her mind. Clearly, they aren't meant to be a couple. Only for Yang. (laughs) I've been seeing this thing on Twitter, and I don't care enough to, like, start, like, a problem on Twitter. Because no one- everyone's always looking for an excuse to fight uh, on that garbage website. But I keep seeing this thing on Twitter where people are like, Blake and Yang are- their souls are intertwined. They're soulmates because they're- Their eyes are each other's soul colors. It's their souls are intertwined together. And I'm like, oh, okay. So Tyrion is also their soulmates? Because Tyrion has yellow eyes and purple eyes. (laughs) So Tyrion is also Blake and Yang's soulmate. Is that what we're saying? (laughs) Kali and Gira both have yellow eyes. Are they Yang's soulmate now too? Because their their eyes are the color of each other's souls. (laughs) 
It's so goofy. <laughs> that is very silly. That is a very, very silly idea. <laughs> like, clearly they're meant to match, because when you design a team of characters, having colors on each other where they match each other makes sense. And they do it throughout all four girls' designs. Like, like uh, Ruby has a lot of white maybe silver details in her look that is meant to match Weiss. Weiss obviously has black and reds in her design too. Like, like it's so, it's so, yes, Tyrion is Yang's soulmate confirmed. Yes. <laughs> what does that mean? Is Cinder Yang's soulmate? Yeah, I, I, I know. <laughs> Like, Cinder looks a lot like Blake. Like, a lot of people used to think that they might be related because they look near identical to each other. So, it's just, it's a silly idea. <laughs> it's so silly. <laughs> it's such a minimalistic concept. Like, I, like, if that's what you want to go with, yeah, do what makes you happy. But, jeez. <laughs> What's with the new design? I want it to look different. <laughs> I, I woke up one day and I was like, this is what I want to look like. And then I did it. <laughs> what if they made a white rose cannon? I'd be fine with it. Like, I'm not a huge white rose shipper. I don't particularly care. Um, I would not, I wouldn't be opposed to it, you know. But whatever. <laughs> I feel like Ruby and Weiss have always consistently had more chemistry than Blake and Yang, so I wouldn't be too upset, but I'm not, like, like I'm not rooting for it either. <laughs> Soulmates, was this a CW show? I know, right? <laughs> like, it's fun. Like, you could just date someone. It doesn't have to be, like, the universe intended for them to always love each other because their souls are intertwined. Like, they can just date. <laughs> they can just be in love. They're already together. We don't, like, they've already kissed and said they love each other and had their whole thing. We don't need to also imply that their souls are intertwined with each other. <laughs> also, that would imply Ruby is Yang's soulmate, but only when she's angry, which is gross. Yes. Yes. That's another thing. <laughs> It's so, like, uh, for their eyes to not even matter much in the long run, it's such a silly idea. <laughs> also, Critter, your armband makes me think of a hamburger. Hell yeah. <laughs> if you notice, they, uh, I'm wearing two armbands, and they're the same ones I was wearing before, but I've swapped them on the, to the different arm from what they were beforehand. So... I know, going real crazy. That might be the biggest, craziest change in my design. <laughs> uh, the landscapers are getting closer, so you might be able to hear them more as they blow leaves around for no reason. <laughs> they show up every week and, and they don't do anything. They just blow leaves. <laughs> it's so pointless. <laughs> Alright. Volume 4's opening is so long. It's not the longest. But it's so long for not even being very good, you know? I feel like in re I, I made that video um, where I ranked the uh, Ruby openings. And in hindsight, I think I was too generous to volume four. I'm gonna be, gonna be real. I would, I would rank it lower now. <laughs> As someone who's never really been very into character shipping at all with any series, whenever I see Ship Wars, I just kick back and enjoy the show. Should grab a box of popcorn for that? Yeah. I'm just like, I, cause I've never been offended at like someone else shipping different characters. You know, I've never cared. It's never bothered me. And if I have a ship and it doesn't become canon and some other ship becomes canon, I've also never really cared because I can just have head cannons. <laughs> people get so offended when their head cannons don't become reality. Or when other people's head cannons don't line up with theirs. And I'm like, what does it matter? <laughs> it's just for you. It doesn't change anything. It just makes you seem like an incredibly selfish person to care so much what other people's head cannons are and if they align with yours. Like... <laughs> 
Do people actually pinch each other on St. Patrick's Day? Oh yeah, it's St. Patrick's Day! I keep forgetting! I never have to worry about it because I'm green. <laughs> Thank you again, Ranger. If Yang and Blake's souls are intertwined, I expect them to be able to mix their semblances together. Yes. That is something like, 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 if we're going to do a soulmate plot, then doing something like that is how I would always want that kind of, like, ability to play out. Like, if, if soulmates is really a thing, I think it should have, like, especially in a world where there's a magic system, there should be, like, a tangible visual representation of that. That's more than just, their eyes are the same color, you know? <laughs> especially, so, oh yeah. I only like Yang X Neo because the ship name is funny and clever. It is. Um, Baked Alaska, which is ice cream that you catch on fire. That's actually very clever. <laughs> but yeah, like Neo's eyes can be any color. I like like ha having it be reliant on someone's eye color is so minimalistic and silly. If Yang and Blake really are soulmates, that's fine. But yes, like Ranger's saying, I would like them to do some crazy combo move that proves their soulmatedness. <laughs> Yeah, um, sometimes people pinch each other. Um, I don't think that's really much a thing anymore. Uh, I, it was never, to be fair, it was never really a thing in my world to begin with. So, <laughs> like, like, like when I was growing up, we didn't really pinch each other. So, I don't, maybe it's more common in other places. Um, if you're going around pinching strangers, especially, you're weird. <laughs> don't, don't, there's no reason for you to touch a stranger in any way whatsoever. <laughs> Some ship names are bad. Yes. Yes, they are. Some of them are really lazy and lame. <laughs> the fact that we have a ship chart. <laughs> And some of them are so not good. I'm gonna be honest, White Rose, not that good. It should have been Candy Cane. That would make way more sense because it's red and white. And also, um, Candy Canes are a winter treat and Weiss is the winter themed character uh, in the main, main four girls. <laughs> um, and also it is a sweet, it is a dessert and Ruby likes sweets. And so it would have been better. They should have been candy cane. Um, I will take no further questions. <laughs> My word is law. <laughs> Black Sun, also terrible ship name. One of the absolute worst. It should have been Eclipse. It should have been Eclipse. Because that's what happens when the sun turns black. It's if... <laughs> this is, okay. All right, all right, okay, all right. Okay, you ready for some real anger? So Ruby used to be funny. Ruby used to be- Hello, Eric. <laughs> Ruby used to- Sorry, I yelled about being angry the moment you showed up in chat. <laughs> so Ruby used to be funny. It wasn't ever, like, the most amazing ever, but it was genuinely funny. And starting with volume four, they start this thing where their humor is just the absolute worst. But they'll have characters laughing their asses off as if it's the funniest thing in the world. And I don't understand. I don't understand how, because it's not like the writers changed. It's still Miles and Carrie. How could they be so good at comedy before? But then suddenly with volume four, it just takes a nosedive and they never get it back on track. <laughs> Ryan, why am I a monster? Because I'm beautiful. <laughs> Aren't I pretty now? <laughs> am I not the most beautiful person you've ever seen? I'm so happy with this design. <laughs> I I took a picture of it to send to my sisters and uh, I just keep staring at it. I would just fall asleep staring at my new design because I love it so much. It, uh, one of my favorite things, a little subtle detail, my pupil is a diamond, not a circle. I love it. <laughs> it's amazing. I love it. <laughs> but yeah, the humor is just so bad and I don't get it. I don't understand. It feels like the writing changed. Between volumes one through three and then volumes four onward, the writing in general really feels like like, it feels like that there was completely different writers. Hi, pretty weird duck! Hi! 
<laughs> one of their most funny ones is you just made one friend and one enemy. A lot of Yang, yes, a lot of Yang early on was so funny. She was hilarious in the first few volumes. And I don't know if it's like, I'll say hi to Allison for you. I'll text Allison right now. I'll text her right now and say chat says hi. Um, yeah, I don't know if it's because they changed everyone's characters to be like moody and broody. Because, oh, it's a serious drama now. Chat says hi, smiley face, heart emoji, send. All right. <laughs> hi, Godzilla. Thank you. You always just got here. Why is Critter a demon? Aren't I cool? Aren't I, aren't I cool? <laughs> is this not the best design ever? <laughs> You sent it to your sisters. I hope she wasn't expecting to sleep without nightmares. Why? You don't want me showing up in your dreams? <laughs> Aren't I beautiful? I'm so happy with how this design turned out. I cannot get over it. I'm in love with myself. It's so good. I, another small detail I really like. My necklace has a like a little little pentagram on it. That's fun. I love that. <laughs> oh, she texted back. Oh shit. She says, smiley face, heart emoji, heart emoji, heart emoji, hi, with seven exclamation points. So. <laughs> there you guys go. She says hi, with lots of love. <laughs> Allison, is that twins' name? No, Allison, uh, Allison's been in all of our videos before. Allison are you? is her YouTube channel, which you should definitely watch because she has some hilarious videos on there where she cooks things. She's our best friend. I call her my sister. She's not really my sister, but she is in my heart. I, when I refer to my sisters, I'm talking about twins, who's my real sister, and Allison, who's my best friend, but she's my sister at heart. <laughs> Can I shoot lasers at my eye? I can't, unfortunately. <laughs> I'm not as cool as Cyclops. <laughs> yeah, Twins is roommate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thirsty. Yeah, seven whole exclamation points. <laughs> high, high praise. <laughs> Sisters in spirit, exactly. Like, like... Like, I, I, if you put a gun to my head and was like, is she your sister? I would say yes. <laughs> like, biologically, no. But in my heart, yes. <laughs> um, yeah, so, uh-huh. Should I keep ranting about Yang? This is sucks. I think Yang's story in Volume 4 is actually pretty strong. I think this had really really strong foundation for her character to move from. Like, her, like, like, her back and forth with this situation, it was so interesting. Arguably one of the most interesting things about Yang's entire character. Or about the whole volume, like, it, uh, as a whole. <laughs> Look how cute your art is moving around. I know. Oh, Allison! It's Allison! Look, everyone! Allison's in chat! Look at her! <laughs> Tell her hi! <laughs> there she is! Allison, are you right there? Tell her hi! <laughs> Tell her how cool and pretty she is, because she's very cool and very pretty. <laughs> the hair looks like noodles. Thanks! <laughs> I was just felt it, just in my heart. It, it, it just, it just, like, I was like, this is how it looks, and it, it's perfect. <laughs> Thank you, Sora. In Volume Eight's opening, Yang is smiling, and I was like, why is she smiling? Then I remember she was the fun-loving one. It's so easy to forget that. Yes. Like, that happens a lot. Where, especially in openings or promotional material, Yang will show a hint of what her character used to be. Like, the fun, happy-go-lucky one. But then you get to the actual show, and she's crossed arms, and broody moody, and bleh. It's, it's almost like they know the original concept for Yang was what really sold the show. But, like, story-wise, they can't just suddenly- I mean, they could make her like that again. But for some reason, they think, like, making her a big moody broody grump all the time is, like, cool now or whatever. <laughs> but she gets- yeah, volume four. 
lots of great potential in Volume 4 with Yang. She's really interesting. She goes through a really interesting arc. Uh, I feel like it. I, I would have loved to see it on screen more because uh, it's so interesting. And I would have loved to see her like training up to the point where she feels like it's natural again. I So that's what I want. And that's good. Those wanting more is a good thing to to want out of a show. And then in volume five, they really just nosedive her character into just being uh, just like, like too cool, ed- edgy, edgy five ever, <laughs> pissy angry. I'm gonna sit here and be saucy and bleh. <laughs> Axel says I'm kind of chubby. Yes, I'm. Th- Thick. Thick with four C's. <laughs> I'm big and curvy and thick. Because <laughs> I'm a sexy, sexy lady this way. <laughs> so yeah, volume four. Good Yang. Yang was really good in volume four. I'm gonna, you know what? I'm gonna say it. Yang was the best part of volume four. Ren and Nora's stuff is good, but it only happens at the very end of the volume. But, uh... Yang is consistently the best part of Volume 4, and I wish there was more of her in it. And then Volume 5, I just don't think Miles and Carrie know what quote-unquote cool is. (laughs) Imagine Yang and Nora being besties and making happy squeals because OMG. I'm actually, that is like a headcanon, that's an AU thing that I've been getting way more into lately. I've been working on an AU concept. I ho- I'm hoping I can have it done for Summer of Ruby, um, but we'll see. <laughs> uh, but, like, yeah, Yang and Nora having, like, a stronger friendship is, like, a big thing I've been thinking about lately. So that's a lot of fun. They also just have such good vibes, and they've never talked to each other. But their characters are, like, the vibes <laughs> that I want. <laughs> Thick with four C's and seven exclamation marks. Yes. So, Allison, thick squared. <laughs> Chubby equals cute. Yes, it's true. There's too many, like, big, like, uh, every time I look at VTubers and whatever, they're always skinny, pretty anime characters. And that's cool and all. That's, like, they're always cool looking. But there's not enough thick Thick girls out there <laughs> to 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 be your big human pillow. <laughs> I remember volume four or five. They just kind of blend together. It's yes, like four. It's easy to remember four being worse than it actually is. I think the thing is the bad parts of four is ludicrously boring. This is one of them. Like Crow not talking to Raven. That same thing I've been talking about a lot about characters talking but not saying anything. Um, This is like the biggest example of it. Hands down the worst example of it. Nothing about this conversation is worth anything in the long run. Uh, is it, is the AU the hypothetical team with Cardin, Penny, Sun, and Velvet? It's not. I do love that team, though. Um, uh, it is a new, completely different team for Penny. <laughs> I just can't stop making AU teams for Penny. It's too easy. <laughs> um, but I, I'm excited for it. I, I think you'll all like it. I think you all will like it. If you design both legs to be small, it makes the stomach and hips look bigger. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's also just playing around with body shapes more. Not a lot of people, when people are learning how, like, getting their sense of style to draw, they tend to, like, stick with one general body shape. And I understand that because it's easy. Like, once you figure it out, it's easy to do the one thing you figure out over and over again. But once you got that figured out, I implore everyone to play around with body shapes. I mentioned Orange Abyss. Orange Abyss, I keep seeing you popping into chat, and I keep missing your comments. <laughs> but Orange Abyss is actually really good at different body shapes. Like, you got tall, skinny people, smaller, shorter people, heavier set people. Orange Abyss has a really good, like, sense of, like, body shapes with their characters. So, like, play around with it more. It, you'll, you'll level up and grow as an artist. <laughs> It also makes your characters look more interesting. Because if you rely only on, like, hair and clothes to differentiate your characters, it can be very boring. Not boring, just, you know, minimal. Limited. You're limiting yourself. If you play around with body shapes more, I feel like there's more, like, 
like possibilities for you to to play with moving forward um i was so i got distracted i was talking about how volume four has ups and downs <laughs> and it does the thing is volume five is bad all the way through there's no good moment of volume five <laughs> like like i've tried to make um best of lists that include one part from each volume and it's always hard with five because nothing is good from five four the bad parts are ludicrously boring but the good parts are really good this episode's gonna be a bad example. We're on episode five, Menagerie. Uh, this is gonna be a bad example because this is the worst. <laughs> it's the worst episode. <laughs> it's so boring. It's so dumb. I, uh, we're, I'm gonna go on like 17 rants about Blake. Hold on to your asses because my, my Blake hate is gonna pop off <laughs> once these 700 Tide ads stop playing. <laughs> I like drawing sexy ladies and that will never change. Good. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Who doesn't like drawing sexy ladies? Like, if you can figure out how to draw a sexy lady, why would you ever not be drawing a sexy lady? They're fun to draw. <laughs> they, they, they get fun outfits. <laughs> Sponsored by Gain. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> Hashtag not sponsored. <laughs> Hold on to your butts. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Blake, it's such a shame. I wanted Blake to be my favorite. When the the color trailers were coming out, I was in love with Blake's design. I was immediately won over. I wanted her to be my favorite character because she was so cool. And then her trailer was so different. She was so unique and mysterious. And as the show went on, I just hated her more and more and more. <laughs> Thank you again, Godzilla Slayer. Can't wait to see Blake... Physically abuse son. I know it's such a weird it's such a bad weird decision and like I don't I Again, I think they thought it was a comedy thing. How did their comedy take such a nosedive? Like I wonder if they took comedy lessons or tried to replicate the comedy from something else but They just didn't get it like, is that, is that why the comedy takes such a bad turn this this volume? Thank you, George. Any big plans for Magical Girl May this year? Uh, yes. <laughs> yes, but I'm still, like, working on it. <laughs> I have, like, a lot of things I'm already working on and planning out. So, like, I know what I want to do for Magical Girl May. I'm just, like, trying not to get myself really freaked out in the planning stages because I tend to do that a lot. <laughs> I, I tend to, I tend to like get my plans going and then I panic about my plans. Um, I'm actually very happy my Ever After High episodes are coming out because that means I can stop panicking about them. <laughs> uh, speaking of, episode two came out last Friday and this Friday is episode three and I'll give you a little bit of a spoiler. Episode three is the longest one. So I'm excited. <laughs> They wanted to make a tsundere, but don't know what makes one endearing. Yes, that is the that is a tricky fine line with tsundere as a character. Is it's very easy to just make them very obnoxious. All right, let's talk about how um, horrible menagerie is. <laughs> is someone tickling me constantly? I just make myself laugh. I find myself hilarious. Um, so that's. <laughs> I can't help it. <laughs> All right. So Menagerie. They talk about how it's crowded, but they drop themselves off at a dock slash market, which are two of the busiest places like people tend to be in. And even then, it's not that crowded. Like there's a couple of groups of people here and there. But it's really not that bad. Like, Blake and Yang aren't even- I'm sorry. I called him Yang. Blake and Sun aren't even standing that close to each other. And that is way worse with this wide shot. Because Sun is holding himself like he has to tiptoe around huge crowds of people. But there's like five people on screen. There's been more people in the 
fucking school they attended <laughs> at any given point in time. But they realized his, like, delivery for the line is like, oh, it's I have to walk past someone because of how cramped it is. So they had to arbitrarily make one jackass walk between the two of them for no reason. And I don't understand because they have background characters. They have a bunch of background characters. Throughout all of volumes four and five, the most amount of background characters we see are on Menagerie. So I don't know why they didn't just add more background characters. Why did they make Menagerie so huge? Like, the, the path, the walkway is wide as hell. If they wanted it to look more cramped, just make it feel like a smaller path and have more background characters milling around. It's so easy. And I wonder, like, theoretically, it could have been like their engine couldn't handle having that many background characters. But I feel like you could have, like cheated that somehow like like have like still images of background characters rather than like full models walking around and it's it's bad <laughs> it's bad and annoying because blake's whole thing is how it's a horrible place that they're stuck on menagerie and they're not even stuck on menagerie they could leave they have a ship they came on a ship the, people could leave whenever they want <laughs> there's no reason they have to stay on menagerie but two it's like this beautiful tropical paradise of magic and it's gorgeous and people would kill to live on a tropical island like this and, and it's like i don't even see what the problem with staying on menagerie is because it's not nearly as crowded as they're implying it to be and then also they made the ludicrously stupid decision to make blake the princess of menagerie and i don't understand why <laughs> Yeah, render times, but a narrow, narrow, narrower road would have been neat or lower detail ones further away, maybe? Yeah, like I think there's ways you could cheat that. If the point is to make Menagerie crowded, the least they could do is do something to make it crowded. There are easy cheats you can do for that. Have there be more trees to like make it like letterbox the sides of the screen, you know? There's so many things you could do. Or just have, like, the trees be overgrown. Have there be, like, a bunch of, like, 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 vines and vegetation in the way of characters. Something. <laughs> but yeah, having Blake be the princess of Menagerie is so goofy. It is the goofiest. It is the baddest decision. It's so, like, she sits there and yells at Weiss for her privilege and then you turn around and you find out Blake has more social standing than Weiss does. <laughs> like, Agira used to be the leader of the White Fang, and now he's still the mayor or whatever. Like, he, he's the one in charge of the whole town. Even though he's not in- he doesn't run the White Fang anymore, but they also clearly come to, like, check on him regularly. You know, he's not surprised when the White Fang shows up. They're coming to talk to him, even though he's not in their their ranks anymore. It's just, it's just, and, and so she has all this like wealth and privilege and space. She also has the audacity to sit there and be like, Menagerie is cramped and this is terrible how small and cramped our island is. And then they modeled her house to be huge. I was thinking about this very recently because I saw a post on Tumblr where someone was talking about how huge- like, look at- like, like, they're dwarfed on her steps. Like, this is- like how gigantic the door is. <laughs> thank you, thank you, M3D. Quick thought experiment. If Gira and Kali were just Blake's old mentor figures from the White Fang instead of parents, what would that change? I think it would change a lot, because it implies that she got power or social standing from the White Fang. You know, she left home, whoever her parents were, presumably a less well-off family, and then if K Gira and Kali were the family she chose to walk into, it would imply she was choosing to walk into a, a place of higher social standing. And then choosing to leave them, even though, like, leaving that more luxurious lifestyle because of how she feels about the White Fang and how she doesn't agree with their ideals anymore means she's leaving behind 
the life of luxury, the life of riches and, and, and things like that. Because she's standing with her ideals that the White Fang are wrong. But because it's her family, the intention is that she left this place of privilege to f do a fight for the White Fang. And then, like, the idea of leaving the White Fang is, feels like a less challenging decision for her. Because now she gets to enter this life of luxury again. She, she, enter, she re-enters the life of privilege. She went from being someone privileged to fighting the, uh, like a harder fight because of her ideals to re-entering the life of privilege again. She went from an easy decision to a hard decision back to an easy decision. You know? It just, it's bad. It makes Blake look like a very selfish character. Like, she doesn't understand the real grand scheme of what the White Fang is trying to do. Thank you, Godzilla. Godzilla Slayer. And they call DB... And they call DBS character assassination. I know. <laughs> it's so... There's, volume 4 makes such huge shifts for all the characters. And I think it was an attempt to, like... Oh, it's all serious now. It's a serious story. The characters have these... They went through a, a big event with the fall of Beacon. They're different now. And I, I, I don't think it was a good idea in the long run. Because these characters feel like less of a character. They feel like selfish. Also, the fact that she's the princess of Menagerie. And she's coming back home to her mommy and daddy in their gigantic mansion. I don't know why they modeled the mansion to be so huge in the first place. And then... And then her mommy and daddy just immediately love her again. They accept her back home with open arms. Like, instantly. And she has no struggle. Nothing was a struggle for her. Getting her new stupid outfit couldn't have been a struggle. She got on the boat and traveled back to Menagerie with barely a struggle. Because even though she had to fight the Sea Fei Long, oh, here comes her, her little stalker boyfriend's son. He's going to sit here and help her with every problem. She doesn't need to worry about it herself. She doesn't have to struggle. She goes back home to mommy and daddy, and they love her instantly. You can come back into our giant mansion. Never has to struggle. And so for her to sit here and get all pissy and angry... Even though everything she has been trying to accomplish has been handed to her on a silver platter, all volume. All volume. She has not had to fight that hard to achieve her goals. Everything has been given to her. And so to have her sit here and like give these speeches about, about fighting. Who says I'm done fighting? It it's falls on hollow, on hollow ears. It's so empty. She, she, and everything she goes with, with the rest of this volume of her arc on Menagerie is her putting herself into positions that she doesn't need to. It's very silly. It makes her seem like a selfish character who, a selfish character who is very privileged, but acts like she isn't. Like, she acts like her small world problems are the, the end of the world. Even though everything in the world is bending around her to make her life as easy for her as possible. Also, for her to sit here and chew out the Albane brothers about the tragedy at, at Beacon, when she ran, people are dead. Yeah, and what did you do? You ran away. <laughs> you ran away from all your friends. So what are you sitting here being pissy about? <laughs> it's very it's the hypocrisy. A lot of Ruby, a lot of the like protagonist-centered morality of the show uh, highlights a bunch of hypocrisy from the main characters, especially. Thank you again, Godzilla Slayer. Who says I'm done fighting? You did. <coughs> You did on the boat. You're so, you're so right. <laughs> it's like no, I'm not. I don't want to fight anymore, son. Uh, okay, so you're done fighting. <laughs> no, I'm not. Cause I need to try to paint myself like I'm the victim somehow. I got my one of my best friend's arms cut off, and then I ran away from everyone and abandoned my problems. But I, but I'm the victim. <laughs> 
What if Beacon never fell? There's a lot of- I'll watch Evermorrow. Evermorrow is doing an AU situation. Ruby Evermorrow. They have like six episodes out. They're doing a really cool AU concept where Beacon didn't fall. Thank you, George. An old idea of mine. What if Blake had a younger sibling who was based on Mowgli? Talking from- Taking from Gira and Kali's Jungle Book roots. Also, they adopted them. Also, they adopted them. I think it would be cool. I think it would be cool. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> thank you, Shadow Dante. And thank you, Furry Giraffe. Archie shot themselves in the foot when they made Blake's parents a different animal species. A different a different animal species. They should have made her their adoptive daughter. And it would have been a cool reference to the Jungle Book. Okay, so I want to talk about both of your guys, both of your um, super chats at the same time. Because I feel like they like will uh, overlap in similar ways. I agree with both of you yeah, very much. <laughs> Um, one, Blake having a sibling. I really wanted her to have a sibling. When I first saw, um, the opening for volume four, and I'm seeing a lot of people saying this too on my character short, uh, talking about Kali. When I first saw the opening for volume four, because they released it early, I thought Kali was going to be Blake's sibling. I couldn't tell if it was a, a girl or a boy with slightly longer hair, but I really wanted Kali to be like a sibling who was like in love with Blake and idolized Blake and might have like had the old ideas that Blake used to have. Like ba basically being a glimpse of what Blake had been like before she joined the White Fang. Thank you, Anton. Can't make it look like I'm too cowardly to fight. Daddy might not be as coddling of me after I, after my not girlfriend's arm got cut off. Blake probably. <laughs> You're very right. Like I, I, this is convenient that she never mentions that part when hanging out with her mommy and daddy in their giant comfy mansion. <laughs> but yeah, I wanted Blake to have a sibling. This part we'll watch the opening, I guess. Uh. Yeah, this part, right here. Like, Kali pops out from behind Gira when they push away Sun. And, like, I thought, like, she was- Because she's so- she, sh She's shorter than Blake. So I thought she was a younger sister. And I thought that was awesome. Having it be a brother and having it be based on Mowgli would be really cool. And so that tumbling into uh, Furry Giraffe's comment. Being like, um... Uh... Sorry, I totally lost my train of thought because I, I was thinking about the Tide commercial <laughs> or, or Downey, whatever it was. Yeah, having it be like if they were adopted, you know, I because then that also solves a lot of the problems of like the life of luxury Blake has. And it's if like her and she had like an adopted sibling, because also no one has any siblings outside of Team Ruby's main character, like, like, Yang and Ruby are sisters. Like, and they're half-sisters. Having it be an adopted family. And the only other ones who do that is Ren and Nora, but they don't treat each other like siblings because they're in love with each other. So... <laughs> so... <laughs> so having Blake and, like, an adopted brother who could potentially be Mowgli, I think would be neat. And also, we could, like, tie into ideas of G Gira and Kali, maybe one of them is a human or something like that, you know? Thank you again, Godzilla Slayer. If I found out my friend ran away after I took a bullet for them, I'd be mad, yes. And Yang is almost mad. That's a, one of the great plot points we'll get to in volume five. Yang is mad briefly, and then she quickly gets over it once Blake is actually on screen. <laughs> Because she has a brief conversation with Weiss, and on one hand, I'm like, I kind of like this conversation Weiss gives her. But on the other hand, I'm like, Weiss's reasoning is very bananas. And this should be a conversation Yang has with Blake when she shows up, but she doesn't. <laughs> she just likes Blake. She's, it's, we, we, we grew off screen because 90% of the development for our characters is off screen in this show. <laughs> So, I have been talking nonstop about Blake this whole time. Uh, because it's been a lot, it's very Blake heavy, especially at the beginning of the volume. Blake and Yang, very Blake heavy in the beginning of the volume. We haven't really seen Team Ruby since two episodes ago, and we only saw them briefly as they were getting to this town to like rest for a little bit. So, having them finally coming back 
at episode six really hammers home that I think pacing wise, they didn't know what to do with volume four. They didn't know whose stories to prioritize. Cause I feel like Ruby's story, Ruby's story is the proactive one. She's the one going out and like, she's making efforts personally to do something, to go somewhere on her own accord. Blake's, Weiss's and Yang's stories are very, I guess, reactive. Like Yang makes the decision. She has to come to terms with the decision of putting the arm on. Weiss is kind of just having like like they're waiting to have re- certain revelations basically like the the world needs to reach certain moments around them for them to make their steps in their development where ruby and ranger are moving forward for a purpose and they're also the only ones who are dealing with the prot plopper <laughs> with the prot plopper <laughs> with the plot proper they are they're trying to get to haven because they wanted to talk about cinder they never do but that is the like reasoning behind their trip. They're also the ones who talk to Crow and they learn about relics and maidens. Like like they're the ones engaging with the real story. And so it's weird that they are barely in this volume. They 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 just go from one town to the next and every town looks exactly the same because it's easier that way to reuse the same models over and over again. <laughs> but like, they're, they're the ones doing things, and yet they don't ever show up on screen. Like, they're barely on screen. And it also feels like Ren and Nora's thing at the end only exists at the very end of the story. We're first setting up the idea... Like, we see the hoof print of the Nekalavi in episode two, but it t- took six episodes for us to start to hint at the development Ren is going to feel with this volume. It feels like a little... Too little too late. Or it could have been more evenly spread out across... The, the volume. <laughs> Prot Plopper. The next Dark Souls boss. <laughs> it does sound like that, doesn't it? <laughs> Thank you again, Godzilla Slayer. I need to see Team Ruby tame and friend a Beowulf. Okay, that's something I always wanted. I was always like, could we do more with the Grim? Like, could someone control the Grim? I, I think I was talking about having a character with a, a semblance that could control the Grim to, like, rival Salem. That would be really cool. I, I think I, I really cool. <laughs> Critter, I'm trying to draw long, spread out hair. It's difficult. Any advice? Oh, it is difficult. My advice: be very loose, like 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 straight hard lines. Will will make hair feel like it's not flowing necessarily. Be really really loose with your with your. Um, grip on your pencil, like thin, flowy strokes of your hand and whatever like art device you're using. And I was I would suggest, especially if you're like not certain what to do, I would suggest f- looking up a a reference. Like there are characters with really long, flowy hair, and everyone kind of does it differently. So think about like if if think of some kind of reference that you could use that would fit the style of what you're trying to go for. Um. Also, remember, hair goes everywhere. It whips around everywhere, flies around in the wind. It is always going a bunch of different places. So keep that fluidity to it. Guys, miraculously, we've gotten a different ad. (laughs) We've gotten a different commercial. It's razors now. It's Gillette. Oh my god. Have we crossed the event horizon for Tide? (laughs) Where is Ruby's trauma? Thank you, Philip. Thank you, Philip. <laughs> Where is Ruby's trauma and all the nightmares she has? I okay, okay. That was a thing I was super excited for. I was so excited. Good evening, Zero to Hero. <laughs> I was so excited for Ruby because she was having those nightmares early on, and it's like, oh boy, we're gonna do a thing, and then they immediately abandoned the idea after episode two, three, one of them. She never has that again. And I'm like, what were we doing? <laughs> Why did we do this? Just because you hint at the idea of of maybe doing a thing with your character, that doesn't mean you did it. <laughs> <coughs> Sorry. Like, I hate windy days. My hair covers my face completely and I can't see it or breathe. Yes, those days where you just give up. Like, you try to hold your hair back, but it's not working, so you just give up entirely and you accept your fate. That's why I cut all my hair off to be all short. Because I was tired of it. (laughs) 
It kept getting in my dang face. It was when I would lean down to draw something and my hair would all fall over and cover up my page. And finally I'm like, I'm in hell and I want it all gone. And so I cut off a bunch of my hair and I made it really short and I never went back. <laughs> I've kept it short since. <laughs> Also, on that note, thank you, Godzilla. The ads are Ruby's nightmares. <laughs> that's a, yes, <laughs> that's what it is <laughs> throughout the whole season. <laughs> yeah, another thing, we haven't seen Weiss since episode two. And admittedly, her plot point is the most minimal. So I understand having her story be like, really segmented out like it's episode two episode six and then i think episode nine like they really they really spread the whole thing out with her story and her story is basically i'm stuck at home i realize i want to leave i leave and so i understand that i feel like we could have used this to like punctuate something else more specifically because she's very segmented we could have used this time to really highlight what our time frame is but for some reason in this volume miles and carrie decided they're really afraid of calendars and they're like we can't mention time time is not a real we can't talk about it so everyone is going to be confused constantly about what everyone's plot lines are doing is everything happening happening simultaneously of each other how long has everything been? <laughs> Especially when we learn that everyone has, everyone's aged a year at this point. Everyone's gotten to the point where everyone's age is now one year older. Um, so like Ren, Nora, and Jean are, they were all 17 in volumes one through three. We're at the point where now all of them are 18 and Ruby was 15 and she is now 16 if I remember correctly. That or she's 16 and she was No, I think it's... Yeah, one of them. Everyone's aged one year. So now we're like, well, how long was volumes one through three? Was that a year? How long have, has everyone been traveling for? A month? Two months? How long did it take for Blake to get back to Menagerie? Is everyone's stories happening simultaneously? And I feel like if they weren't afraid of calendars, because someone gave Miles the worst advice ever, of don't talk about time zones or time frames and, and then you'll never have to worry about it. That really screwed Miles over. I feel like we could have used Weiss's scenes to like highlight the exact amount of time that has passed between like events. So then we know like, cause it feels like everything's happening like one day after the next when I know it's not supposed to. So if like we see Weiss in episode two, and it's like, in two months from now, you'll be doing your thing. And now we're here and it's like, oh, now we understand it's been two months. You know, Blake and Son took two months to get to Menagerie. Uh, you know, Ruby, Weiss, or no, Ruby and the rest of Ranger have been traveling from one town to the next for two months. But they don't do that. <sighs> Missed opportunity, I say. She was 16 before? Okay. Oscar's 14 now, which I think was weird. Why did they make him even younger? Especially because he looks like he's as old as Ruby. Why didn't they just make Oscar the same age as Ruby? That's confusing to me. <laughs> I like the idea of rare mythical Faunus. I like that too. I actually think they really went with a very boring option with Faunus, where it's like, the way it works is... Um, if your if your parents is if one of them is a faunus and the other one is a human, their child if they're born a faunus will have the same faunus traits as their parents. The the one that is a faunus. Like if you have a, a dad who's a cat and a mom who's a human, and they have a kid and they're a faunus, they will be a cat. But if your parents are two different faunus, they will the the thing that your kid could be is completely random. I understand that sentiment. I like that like that logistically I think it totally works and makes a lot of sense. I think that's totally fine. I think they missed an opportunity to have a uh, faunus cultures where they value specific faunus traits over others. Like if there was a culture like a a, a city, I guess of people who specifically want faunus traits of like randomly let's go with dog if they only want dog faunuses in their 
and their culture because that's like like their family kind of orientation you know like they're the pack or whatever so if they, they wouldn't be they would be less accepting of fondness of other animal traits i think i understand why they didn't do that i also think yeah moose faunus you're the prince <laughs> where i am the king yes <laughs> I think they've really dropped the ball on having cool antlers on their characters. Like, antlers are so cool and easy. More antlers. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I understand why they didn't do that idea with the faunus. Because one, they could already barely handle, like, the regular racism between humans and faunus. Having, like, cultural differences between different animalistic traits with the faunus which is definitely going to be out of their wheelhouse. <laughs> But, you know, if you wanted to flesh out the world more, that's an idea you could play around with. Like having, like, especially like, oh, they're in a place where there's a lot of chasms, like tr very tall trees and lots of chasms. And so only like bird faunus people lived there, like people with wings of some sort, you know, that kind of idea. I think that would be fun. That's a fun thing you could all play with, with AU stories. Do that. <laughs> Also, also the thing with antlers that they never play around with, they don't need to model them. Like, they never give anyone animal ears anymore because they realized, like, modeling them to emote was harder than they realized. So they go with tails because that's a lot easier. But, but you don't need to do that at all with antlers. Why don't you give people antlers? <laughs> okay, this fight, I've talked about it before. I had my whole analysis video. It's one of my favorite fights ever. Tyrion's so cool. I love his weapon. I love his style. He's so weird. I like how he laughs the whole time. He's such a fun, fun, fun dude. <laughs> Thank you again, Godzilla. Beerus. Why is this child screaming at me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> With Oscar being like 14. <laughs> it's just, I don't understand. Because the thing was already, OMG, Ruby's such a special. She's two years younger than everyone else, yet she's allowed into Beacon. And then they're like, well, now we need our boy character for Ozpin to zorp his soul into. We gotta make him even younger because that or they made Oscar, a, they forgot Ruby was supposed to have aged a year and their intention was just to make Oscar slightly younger than Ruby, but they forgot their own characters. <laughs> he is underused, Protag. He's so underused. I, it's such a shame because he's so cool. He's so interesting. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be honest, I'm bummed that Josh Grail, Grell? Is it pronounced Grell? Is that their, I always pronounce their name as Greeley, but I think it might be Grell. They're not gonna be Tyrion anymore. I don't blame them at all. After all the stuff about how, hey, Rooster Teeth is very transphobic. Hmm. <laughs> and then, and, uh, uh, Josh Grell. I believe, uses they, them pronouns. So I understand why they did not want to come back to be Tyrion, which is such a shame. If Tyrion does come back, I don't know who you could get to voice Tyrion that would be as good as Josh's performance because it's so perfect. <laughs> but Josh Girl did tweet that if Dylan Goo picked up Ruby, they'd be coming back for Tyrion. So... <laughs> So I know what I'm rooting for. <laughs> you said my name, that's awesome. And yeah, it's really unfortunate that he's underused. Of course I said your name. I notice everyone, Protag. I see all of you. I may not speak your names out, mostly because I'm not confident in reading. <laughs> Is it their name Jesse? Is it? I knew them as... Jesse James is their name? Is that their name? Am I wrong? I thought, did they change their name? Is that what it was? Thank you. Constella. Constell. Constella Sean. <laughs> remember, what I, remember what I just said about not being confident with names? Um, Ironwood showed open disdain for the rich at the ball. He only focuses on Atlas because tactical location advantages not to protect snobs. Yes. <laughs> yes, like it, he didn't pick to float Atlas away because of um uh because like of favoritism or anything. It's because Atlas is the thing that's floating. If Mantle was the one that's floating, he would have floated Mantle away. He went with Atlas because 
Const pronounced constellation. Oh, okay. I understand. I see. I see now. <laughs> Thank you, constellation. <laughs> So yeah, like Ironwood, it's not like, oh, I gotta protect the rich upper crust elite of Atlas. No, like Atlas was the floating thing. Atlas is already floating because of the staff. So like, to, like, like that's the idea. That's why the whole mission was get as many civilians onto Atlas as they can and then float away and save as many people as they can. But instead, Ruby sat there and bitched and cried because, wah, wah. <laughs> what? why can't we save everybody? And it's like, well, we're trying, but you're not helping. <laughs> and sitting there and actively, like, turning your back against Ironwood and getting in the way of him helping everybody is not helping everybody. <sighs> Volume 8. <laughs> Volume 8's so bad. <laughs> Yeah, t I love Tyrion. Tyrion's awesome. Fun character. Fun design. Fun abilities. Oh my gosh. <laughs> fun weapon. A lot of people make fun of Tyrion's weapon. I think it's cool. I, I like it. I like that it looks reminiscent of Scorpion Claws. Which you might think is goofy. I understand. I think it's fun. <laughs> If the show continues. Yeah, that's true. We never know. I'm not gonna count my chickens before they hatch. Is that the... is that the saying? I'm not gonna put the cart before the horse. That's another one. I think they mean the same thing. <laughs> yeah, I'm not gonna like be like, Ruby's dead before like I know for certain. Because anything could happen. We're really in the wild west of whatever... whatever the hell Ruby's future is going to be. <laughs> Yeah, we're back to Tide. The the, the short-lived um, Gillette ads <laughs> really, really didn't stick around, did they? <laughs> okay, so Oscar. I think, I, this, the, similar to Yang, I think Oscar's story in this volume is fine. Like, it's fine. It's good to, like, we're setting up his character now. Like, the default of who Oscar is and we're establishing the idea of Ozpin being inside of his soul before having to drop all of the exposition. So it doesn't feel like it comes out of nowhere. I think it's well done. I think it is well executed. Like, all of Oscar's- his scenes are kind of boring. Like, uh, um, like they're very slow, uh, a, a big problem with a lot of volume four and five is that um, the sets are huge. Like, every set is gigantic because they have the characters moving around a lot and they don't want them, like, clipping into the things that they're coming near. So every room is huge and empty. Uh, every location is big and empty. So a lot of... And they also don't have him engaging with physical props a lot. Like, he just stands in this room and talks. And it's a very boring room to be in. Like, it's fine... He's got his bed. He did the thing with the book. Um, thank you, Adam, my man. Hey, just got here? What happened to you, Critter? I, I, I'm a gremlin now. <laughs> I had a fun change of design. <laughs> Aren't I pretty? <laughs> and thank you again, Furry Giraffe. It's too bad they didn't play more with Tyrion's fairy tale about true nature. It has tons of potential. Yes. I think, in general, they didn't play around enough with anyone's fairy tales. Like, everyone, they could have gone a lot more hardcore with it, you know? Like, everyone's fairy tales could have been way more meaningful with the development of their characters or characterization or personal plot points. And the fact that they don't do that is so weird to me. The whole point of the show is that they're reimagined fairy tales. And what they end up being is like, oh, we, your name might be the first letter of another fairy tale that you're kind of based on a little bit, but not really. And it's like, what? Why? <laughs> That's so boring. Thank you, Wild Pilot. Oh, now I understand what's with all the Tide ads. It's because Rooster Teeth is all washed up. Oh, damn. That was good. <laughs> that was a good one. <laughs> Get someone grab the fire extinguisher, cause that was a burn. <laughs> but yeah, um, um, and thank you. <laughs> but yeah, with Oscar's scenes, uh, 
they're just kind of slow. Like, I understand what they're doing. They're doing a, a lot of... This one is different. They're actually saying things. It's just small things. A lot of small character defining. Which is fine. It's okay. It's okay that all of his scenes are like that. They're all a little too long, in my opinion. And he's... Like, the locations he's in are all very, very boring. But they're fine. But just like Yang with Volume 5... They really, really dropped the ball with volume, with Oscar's development past volume four. Like at this point, this is good. This is a fine development for him. In volume five though, he's like constantly being taken over by Ozpin. So we don't get any development with Oscar. It's just Ozpin. And also all the scenes where Oscar could be engaging with a cast. Like when, when uh, Weiss and Yang reunite with Ruby, they they have their big dinner together and Oscar's not there for no reason. He he could have participated in the scene where the characters are just talking and hanging out and if anything he could have been used as a great moment to like have him bring up certain topics rather than have Ren just sit there and explain how they've all developed to them. Have Oscar bring up questions that would naturally bring the topic up in conversation because they need to talk to him and then they would realize as they're talking to him about these things he doesn't understand they would realize just how much they have actually changed and grown since last time they haven't actually um is the problem they haven't grown at all uh <laughs> but they really want to imply that they have they really want to convince the audience that they're they've big developed characters now <laughs> Thank you, Danny boy. I wish grim bodies didn't evaporate. Imagine grim pelts and rugs or grim bone weapons used by characters like the Bronwyn tribe. Yes, yes, 100%. Like, uh, like uh, grim like heads mounted on walls of the school. And the, there's no reason for them to disintegrate away other than it's a convenient animation excuse to like make the scene empty afterwards. But it would be way, way cooler. Like, that's part of the fun. Like, I've been watching a lot of Delicious in Dungeon recently. And having them... <coughs> sorry. Having them studying the monsters and figuring out how to cook and eat the monsters is the funnest part. And Grimm are such a not-defined element in this world. And no one's bothering to define them because they can't study them or anything. You know, what are you going to do? Stare at the Grimm while it goes in, on a murder spree? You can't study its remains afterwards. Yeah, or at least the skull part. That'd be interesting. That'd be really cool. But no. Just like everything else in Ruby, it's all half-assed. <laughs> oh, did you see that slap right there? That, that moment where that character hit another character and it was painted like it was a very like painful and dramatic moment that was a bad thing? Keep that in mind for when we go barreling towards the haha -ha funny moment of Blake's slapping son. Keep that in mind because Rooster Teeth doesn't understand tone shifts. <laughs> it's hard to understand who wrote what in volume four. According to the commentary, they kind of split it up, like the characters between each one of them. Like I think Miles says he wrote all the Blake stuff, um, but I don't. they don't clarify who exactly wrote what. And I'm willing to bet Carrie wrote all the Weiss stuff. Because I cannot, as a writer, imagine having a slapping scene that is painted as a very serious, painful moment followed up one episode later with another slapping scene where it's ha ha ha, funny funny, son's in trouble, he got the girl mad. Thank you again, Godzilla Slayer. Someone once made a parody where Superman was the Injustice Superman in the Ruby movie. Nice. Nice. <laughs> That's fun. That's the kind of internet that I was grown up on. <laughs> the weird, weird edits. <laughs> yeah, what's the title of the parody? Thank you, Magma Spacer. What are good ways to characterize your cast? I like the idea of my team even all loading the dishwasher different. Team Licorice? Look up Li... 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 li, li Lyrocus radiata. Lyrocris radiata. I'm sure I said it wrong. <laughs> is it team licorice? Is that what it is? I imagine. I don't know what else LCRS would be. But yes, things like that. Like um like what foods they eat is an easy one to come up with. 
Um, I actually, I have a book on my uh, merch site. It's for five dollars. It's a, a, a create this world is what it's called. It's a prompt art book where you can go through various prompts that help you come up with how to develop a character and a world around that character. <coughs> Sorry. Sorry, I keep coughing. <laughs> so yeah, um, it's prompts like, what do they wear on a- If they were to go somewhere for fun, where would they go? If they had to go somewhere that they didn't want to go, what would be the thing that would convince them to go there? What kind of things would they have in their bedroom? What kind of things would they like to eat? You know, stuff like that. Um, lots of different prompts. You can find things, you, you can find various things like that online, but if you want to support me and drop a cool five dollars my way, uh, you can get the art prompt book from my merch store. Link in the description. <laughs> it's a flower science name. Oh, well, I'm bad with science names. I can't do Latin. Well, I'm bad with Latin. <laughs> Um, Selena. Wait, they had four different people write all four girls? No, I think it was Miles and Carrie. I think each one wrote two girls each, if that makes sense. Like, I think it would be like Miles writes for Blake and Yang, I guess. And uh, <clears throat> Carrie would write for Weiss and Ruby, I guess. I'm not sure exactly how they did it. Um, it's hard to tell. Like, going- it's hard to tell. <laughs> Uh, yeah. <laughs> Man, the whole heir to the dust company is such a nothing plot in the long run. It so is. It so is. Like, I don't care if you're the heir to the company. It's not going to change anything. The whole point... Uh... <laughs> Critter, what's up with the Cyclops? It's me. This is what I look like now. Aren't I pretty? I think I'm gorgeous. I'm in love with this design. <laughs> I am so happy with it. I'm adorable. I'm the most precious ever. I see you. <laughs> I always see you. Um, what was I saying? Oh yeah, the whole heiress thing. Like, Weiss doesn't really care about running the company. She wanted to be a huntress to change people's perception of what the Schnee name means. And she's not gonna do that sitting at a desk in the Schnee Dust Company. So what does it matter? <laughs> We don't get Burkhart and Revis until volume 7. Yes, and I feel like long overdue. Long overdue. <laughs> it's like, I, I felt like, I wanted them to get a female writer on the team way back in volume 2. Like, I really wanted, like, a, a female perspective on Ruby very early on because, um, like, if, if it's two men writing four girls kind of obviously doesn't always work. And a female perspective would be a much better choice. <sighs> Took them long enough, but they finally got it. <laughs> Critter is a shapeshifter. Actually, I'm a witch. I made a potion. <laughs> I did alchemy with my cauldron. It's the same alchemy I use to make like food and stuff. <laughs> Whitley, Whitley kind of looks like a sickly Victorian child. He does <laughs> he's so gaunt and skinny and it's fine he it's also like they don't model his nose very well so it kind of looks like he has this weird sunken in face and yeah he does look awfully sickly which i feel like was also a bit of a missed opportunity like maybe if Whitley was a lot sicker so he had to stay at home more that would explain why he's more attached to his mom and dad than the others you know, because he, he's bedridden. They're the only ones he really gets to see. But, like, I don't know. But, missed opportunity. I don't, I honestly don't know why they introduced Whitley at all. <laughs> I, I really don't understand. Like, like, Weiss already had Jacques to be the villain of her story. Why introduce a younger brother character? I can't imagine why. Like, I, I... But Blake doesn't? Blake doesn't get a sibling? <laughs> yeah, that's not thin shame Whitley. I'm fine with him being a beanpole. I actually think it's a lot of fun that they started to play around with body shapes in this volume. Because they really didn't in volumes 1 through 3. 
Uh, I feel like Whitley, Whitley just has untapped potential. I also don't understand why... I just don't understand a lot about Weiss's whole character arc and Whitley's introduction in general. Wow, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Godzilla Slayer. The difference between the two slaps, Blake and Weiss, is like using group A humor with group B. Yes. Yes. I understand what you mean by that. <laughs> And thank you, Sora. When you write an AU, how much do you follow canon and how much do you make up? I don't know if I should follow the Ruby Fairy Tales or make up my own uh, in my AU. I have done both. I've been working on both. I have one version where I stick as close to canon as I can. And that's fun because it's like trying to like fit pieces together in a puzzle. Where, like, point A still needs to get to point B, and then point B needs to get to point C. But how exactly they do that could change slightly. So, but that's fun. But if you also do, an, like, a completely different AU, then you can come up with all kinds of different crazy examples that the show doesn't necessarily touch on. For example, in my AU, I'm playing around with the concept of religions a lot more. Like, uh, like there's a religion that worships the tree from the Ever After. There's a religion that worships the brother gods together. And then there's a different one that worships only the brother god of light. So, you know, you can play around. and so, But that's not something that we see in the show at all. But th So getting to play around with that idea only works with a completely different AU scenario. So it kind of depends on how exactly you want to play around with it. <laughs> I recommend both. I think they're both fun. Hey guys, it's that scene where everyone lost their minds <laughs> about my take on it. <laughs> Even though it's such a vanilla, plain take to be like, I think Ruby should have reacted to cutting off a character's limb. <laughs> Just saying. And then everyone's like, how dare you? <laughs> She's the hero. She, she was protecting herself. How dare you? <laughs> and I'm like, okay, calm down. It's not that big a deal. <laughs> Thank you, M3D. Imagine Grim types being used more creatively. What if there were Disaster Grim? One based on floods, storms, and earthquakes? Ooh, yes! I love that! It's like Pokemon. It's like, I love when there's like in-universe explanations around mundane things in our reality. Like uh, natural disasters like that, or like something really weird. Like they kind of, they get so close to it. Like the chill Grim in the Fairy Tales book slash the one animated episode. Like, they get so close to playing around with really cool ideas like that, but they just never quite do it. It's, more often than not, it's just an animal. <laughs> not even a very creative animal, either. <laughs> oh, hey guys, you ready? You ready for the next worst episode of the volume? Yippee Skippy! We had two really good episodes. Episodes uh, 6 and 7 are actually pretty top tier. We got the Tyrion fight in both of them. Uh, we finally see Weiss again, and she's singing the best song. <laughs> um, get some important development with Oscar. Not exactly thrilling development. Uh, but episodes 5 and 8, the two that surround them, are real Blake-heavy. And they're just real stinkers. Blake's arc... I've talked about how Yang's arc is the best, and Oscar's arc is fine. It's good. Good groundwork. <sighs> But Blake's arc in Volume 4 is, without a doubt, the absolute worst thing. <laughs> Blake slaps Rand at the end of the volume, but she clearly wasn't trying to hurt or anything. It was a snap out of a slap. Yes. And not, I'm trying to hurt you like Blake's. Yeah. Blake open palm slaps Sun in the face and then turns around and then backhands him again. It's a double slap from her. Where Nora does like a brief little backhand slap to, to Ren. But Ren is also actively trying to pull the two of them back into fighting a demon monster that they're struggling with. You know, that's different. <laughs> you know, S Blake slapped Sun because she was having a conversation with Daddy and Sun accidentally interrupted. You know, the, 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 the circumstances around the slaps are pretty different. <laughs> Weiss just singing Screw You, Jacques. I wish Weiss sang more in the show. Just, like, casually. Like, when you have a character who can sing, I wish I wish she sang more, and I wish Jean played the guitar more. Because he can do that. We saw him. He plays the guitar. I like it when characters do things casually. <laughs> like, like, a lot of the show is very, like... Ugh, God. 
<laughs> a lot of the show is very like, let's dump our exposition on you. I hate this episode. This conversation with Crow is horrible. Like, <sighs> it's so slow. It proves how it's a really stupid, dumb, dumb, bad idea to have characters get caught up on something that we, the audience, already knows. They're asking questions that we already know the answers to. And it's dumb. It's a waste of time. I, it makes me realize that keeping all of Team Ruby excluded from, like, Pyrrha learning about the Maidens was a very bad idea. <laughs> Someone should have known. Someone should have talked. Either Pyrrha should have told Jean everything right from the get-go, like, especially in her moment of, like, freaking out and panic, or... One of the other Ruby girls should have been included in the conversation about you might be the next Fall Maiden. Like, I know they wanted to pick Pyrrha, but if, like, they were like, Ruby, you might also be an, a candidate for this option. So then the Ruby would have this information known. And so we wouldn't have to sit here and have, like, them babbling annoyingly about things we already know the answers to. <laughs> it just pisses me off. It's a waste of screen time. And hammers home how, like, they're just an exposition-driven story. And they do this a lot. Where they'll, where they'll drop an exposition dump. Like, big lore moment. And it's a really big thing. And then later, they'll just repeat the same stuff. Expecting it to be another really big thing. You can't... They do it again with, with Raven's maiden reveal. They do it multiple times. And it's like... It's so not... Good. It just halts everything. Most of this episode is halted to like babble about stuff we already know. And then, and then, <laughs> and then they make the horrible, confusing decision to be like, actually, the maidens aren't the important thing. Relics are. <laughs> oh, oh, what's this? A whole new thing. A whole new plot MacGuffin we're lobbing into the story because we realized. The Maidens alone? We don't- we can't make a plot around that idea. If Salem wants the Maidens, Salem's stronger than the Maidens. So that makes no sense. Why would she need the Maidens? Well now we need to have a reason for the Maidens to exist for Salem to want them. So now... It's like, oh, well, the Maidens, uh, like, have to do something. They, they get these relics. They, they, they're the, the, that's why the Maidens are actually important. You can really tell that they had not figured out the relic part at all. They had come up with Maidens, and then they realized they didn't have a reason for Salem to want the Maidens. And so then they had to come up with the relics. And Miles has talked about how he was... He stayed up all night coming up with the Brother Gods' story. Coming up with the lore around the Brother Gods. He stayed up all night working on it. And I'm like, yeah, I could tell you guys how to come up with it on the last fucking second. Because it makes, it's, we, four years, four whole years into the development of the show for us to finally learn about the main plot. <laughs> The main thing the plot is, is about the relics and getting the relics. So, uh, why did it take us four years to get there? Like, I can understand wanting to keep things, like... I can understand wanting to keep up the secrecy of the concept for the story. I can understand wanting to wait for, like, the end of Volume 3 to have a big tone shift. Like, drop the bomb or whatever. You know, shows have done it before. Monica Magica does it. Berserk did it. Like, lots of shows have done things like that. But to wait until the f near the end of the fourth volume, we're eight episodes into volume four, and now we're finally learning about relics. That's way too long. Thank you, George. Some elements I've been playing with with my Ruby fanfic revolve around technological advancements, specifically Atlas's hand in it throughout history. Yeah! Cool! I think, yeah, that's awesome, because I think Ruby doesn't play around with the technology aspect enough. Like, they have big advancements in technology, but it's all limited to just Atlas. And then here in, like, Mistral, they're walking around with horses and whatever, and it's it makes the, the world feel very separate and disconnected. 
and I don't get it. <laughs> so playing around with the technology a lot, I think is a lot of fun. I also really like it when we mix like advanced technology and like medieval fantasy kind of ideas. I think that's a very fun aesthetic in general. Okay, also the brother gods are stupid. I hate the brother gods. I, I, yes, why did it have to be two gods? It's also so basic. Miles spent all night staying up trying to think of this basic bitch ass story. Are you kidding me? There were two brothers. One was good, one was bad. The good one made flowers, the bad one made fire. <laughs> That's like, I get the idea. They're, it's, they're playing on the idea of the Brothers Grimm. Because, like, that's the gimmick. There are the two Brothers Grimm. That's the gimmick. That's what they're playing with here. <laughs> Have I heard the Ruby is a clone of her mother theory? I haven't. I can imagine what it entails. <laughs> because they do look exactly like each other. <laughs> Thank you, M3D. I'd be thinking about them implying all exposition is boring. Craziest self-report I've ever seen. Like, pick up a book, man, or watch your second show. I know! I know! That's so- It's so stupid that the cat did that! <laughs> Thank you, Godzilla Slayer. Should've made Grimm like Xenomorphs? Yeah. <laughs> Anything being more like Xenomorphs. <laughs> it's so- but yeah, the cat with the exposition thing. It's like, no, you're bad at exposition. There's been tons of great exposition in stories, like Avatar. Um, one example I used in my video when I was like, I had a bunch of pictures on screen of examples of shows that had very good exposition, like, you know, Evil Dead. Fantastic. Just it, exposition doesn't have to be boring. Just because you drone it out obnoxiously slow with like the laziest, most simplistic visuals ever. You make it boring, guys. You can make this stuff really interesting, <laughs> but they don't. <laughs> and and also, it doesn't help that their exposition is just a boring concept. Two brother gods. One was good. One was bad. They fought, and then they didn't. They made people, and then that's it. <laughs> Four relics. We came up with that out of our ass because why not? <laughs> And I'll give them this. The four ideas for the relics is interesting. They could have gone with, like, a lot of simplistic decisions. But choice, creation, destruction, and knowledge is a very unique combo to be the four relics' thing. I'll give them that. Uh, unfortunately, they then do what I call the Steven Universe school of not ever asking for clarifi clarification. Because it's like, what do you mean, choice? What does the relics do? What do the relics look like? Why are they in the schools? How did they get there? Who made the doors? Were they always there? Did the gods make them when they sent Ozpin on his mission? Or did Ozpin make them? How did he make them? What do you mean, choice? What does the choice relic do? What does the destruction relic do? <laughs> like, he sets up the stuff about the relics, and all the kids sit there, slack-jawed, going, oh, okay. And it's like, no! Ask follow-up qu questions. Rather than bog down the beginning half of this scene with them re-explaining maidens to us for no good reason, have the questions be follow-up questions about the relics. But they didn't do that because even though Miles sat there and spent all night coming up with his amazing brother god story, he didn't actually think about what the relics will be. He was just like, that'll be our excuse to move the plot forward. And then everyone was like, well, what do they do? And then he's like, no spoiler questions. And then later in volume five, they were like, I guess we have to finally figure out what these relics are going to be, right? <laughs> And it's very obviously not from the beginning. Oh, it was all planned from the start. No, it wasn't. It very obviously wasn't. Because no good writer would have this work this way. <laughs> Why would you have your characters sit here and hear all these amazing things about the relics and then not have any clarifying questions? <laughs> also, why would you have that scene interrupt itself in the middle there to cut to this scene with Blake? That's another thing with the pacing in volume four. They cut from scene to scene willy-nilly, randomly. Characters disappear for episodes on end for no good reason. I, I, I feel like what they... Sh Hold on. <laughs> I don't understand how they wrote the story. 
because I don't think <clears throat> I don't think they wrote out each character's story in full. <laughs> Critter, I like to call Ruby Schrodinger's potential. That's very accurate. <laughs> Why is Blake nervous about talking to her dad? He welcomed you with open arms. Why are you nervous? If, if like, she hadn't have seen him before now, and he, he, she wasn't sure if he'd be mad, that'd be one thing. But, like, no, he's they've been talking. They've been chill. He's he sided with her against the Albane brothers. Well, so stupid. So I can't imagine they wrote the whole of a character's plotline in, like, like, they didn't sit down and write every plot beat of Blake's story. I don't think that's how they did it. I think what they did was they wrote everything chronologically and then went back and changed things every now and then. It's so weird. I don't, I don't know. It, like, it just, it doesn't feel very well executed. Or maybe they did the opposite, where they didn't write things out chronologically. They wrote all of the different story beats in their entirety, and then thought of weird ways to cut them up and then sew them together. But I can't imagine someone's in there looking at Crow finishing telling the kids about relics and go, yeah, end that scene there, and then cut to Blake and Gira talking about her boobs being exposed or whatever. <laughs> it's, it's just, I don't, it, something I've been trying to do with my AU idea is if I can have a through line where one scene transitions into another scene really well because of, like, a paralleling concept, I'm trying to play with that idea. Like, if someone's sitting there talking about their mom, and then in the follow-up scene with a different character, they're also talking about their mom. Like, I try to do things like that to, like, flow into scenes good from one point to the next, and I just don't understand what their thought process was here. I don't know if they had a thought process. <laughs> I've been watching the behind the scenes for um, Smaller Souls' Volume 5 Redux. Th those have been so good. I've been enjoying the behind the scenes breakdowns more than... Like, the episodes are really good, but I really love hearing, like, the different methods the, the Smaller Soul went about, like, like, why they did the editing choices that they did. That's fun to me. <laughs> it's really fun, very, very cool. Learning a lot about like editing concepts, like like the flow of transitions and scenes that way. There's no connective tissue to any of the scenes. It's true. It doesn't help that no one's like plot can really tie into each other very well. Like Blake's here whining and crying that, you know, oh, I sorry I left you. To join the White Fang. Okay, like her her plot is going home and like making mommy and daddy love her again. That's her plot. And then Weiss's plot is I don't like my mommy and daddy. I want to leave. And then Yang's is I need to get over my trauma and get my arm on. Oscar's is, I have to decide to leave ho home eventually. And Roby's is, like, learning about the real plot with magic while a scorpion dude and a giant grim attack them. So thinking of ways for them to, like, s tie into each other is hard. <laughs> There's no through line. And then we just cut back to this. Yeah, like, why that whole scene interrupted this for no good reason. God, it's so melodramatic. I hate M Miles' performance in volumes four and five because he's doing a fine job as a voice actor. But it's like, uh, why, why doesn't the world know? Why don't the people of Remnant know about the horrors? Where cry, scream, and it's like, calm down, dude. My God, stop being such a whiny, over-the-top baby about everything. John's such a crybaby in these volumes, and it sucks. When I sit there and say I like John as a character. I can't help, like, I understand when people say they hate him because this is real hateable. He's so obnoxious in these volumes. He's such a drama queen Mary Sue, planting himself in the middle of the plot and making him the most important person with his pouty little baby face and it's so annoying. <laughs> 
feel like the scene would have more power if Blake actually did something besides join the White Fang. Like if she helped usurp Gira or something. Yes, 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 yes. Like she, like all she's like is like, I yelled at you. I called you cowards. And it's like, okay, teenagers say things like that to their parents every other week. <laughs> what do you mean? That's the big thing you're worried about? Yeah, it also doesn't help that they don't go into any detail about Blake's past in the White Fang. We don't really know what the White Fang does. <laughs> like, they hijacked a train. They worked for Roman Torchwick for a while. So, <laughs> like, I don't, like, what was she doing? What did, what, what? Why was she so nervous about going back home? Yeah, you can't spell Ruby without a J. The J is silent. I wish he was silent. How often he screams and cries. <laughs> Everyone falls into the, the ever after. All of our main characters. And right at the end, Jean. Special little Jean. Gotta have the ever after Wonderland filler story with Jean present. It's too early to know if Volume 9 really is filler, but it feels a lot like it's gonna be filler. <laughs> yeah, Blake's scene would have made more sense if she betrayed them like Zuko did to Iroh, but they didn't even bother. Yeah, it's such a lackadaisical volume. It's a lot of people sitting around doing nothing. Like, there's very, very- this is the volume with the least amount of fights overall as well. Like, uh... <laughs> I hate Ruby in the scene. I hate her. Her voice is so terrible in these volumes. <laughs> Why couldn't he trust me? I don't know my own uncle's semblance, even though he like trained me and I love him with my whole heart. Cause that's stupid and the writers are very bad at their jobs. <laughs> Thank you, George. Kind of building off of what Godzilla Slayer put down. Ruby versus Alien or Ruby versus Predator could be pretty cool. Yes, that would be fun. I think Ruby versus Predator would be more fun because I think Predator would have more of a struggle against Ruby. I think Alien would beat them pretty quickly. <laughs> like, like, I don't know. They tend to beat Grimm. They tend to be pretty good against monsters, but yeah, Predator would be way more fun. I think Predator would have more fun fighting them with their different semblances and weapons and stuff. Um... But yeah, it's so dumb. Yeah, I'm a Cyclops now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for noticing, Sebastian. <laughs> it's a subtle change. <laughs> yeah, it's it's dumb that Ruby didn't know Crow's semblance. It's dumb that characters don't know each other's semblances, period. Like, everyone should, like, like that should be a pretty, like, quick thing to, like, especially their family. He trained Ruby. He raised her. He helped raise her. Trained her to use the scythe. He's her beloved uncle that she loves more than everything. And she doesn't know what his semblance is. Like, if it was something, like, in-universe where not everyone had a semblance, and that, like, if having a semblance was more rare, or if it was, like, considered uh, offensive to ask someone about their semblance, but it never is, it's not painted that way at all. It's kind of implied everyone has a semblance, especially if there's some sort of huntsman or huntress. And so for Ruby to not know his semblance is incredibly stupid, especially because you could have had anyone ask about it. Like, Nora could have asked about it, you know? And have Ruby be like, no, don't say. And then it's like, I don't want to- if you talk about bad luck, bad luck happens. That could be something. But no, they don't. They just have Ruby. Oh, there it is. All the slapping. <laughs> Gotta beat up the friend who abandoned his team and traveled to a completely different island he's never been to before. Just to protect you. Just to help you. To sit there and support you. And he assumed she was going to fight. He assumed she was going somewhere to go on like a war path against the White Fang. And he left his team behind and went to Menagerie, a place he's never been before, to help her with the fight he thought she was going on. He has done so much bending over backwards to help her, to support her through this. And she's sitting here just slapping him because I was talking with my daddy. How dare you? I was going to get my uh, allowance to get raised up to $2,000 this week. And now he'll never listen to me. I'm never going to have my another yacht at this rate, son. How dare you? Like, like I watched Mean Girls over the weekend because I wanted to watch the musical version. Um... 
but I wanted to remember what the original movie was like. So I rewatched Mean Girls recently over the weekend. And Blake gives off such plastics energy in this season. She's such plastics. So much Regina George. Like, like, my way or the highway, how dare you? I'm doing something a specific way and I don't like you doing something different. On Wednesday, we wear pink. Tall girls in the middle. Bib, bib. <laughs> Thank you, Dante. Dante Hart. Thank you. Vid on the invisible, visible. Vid on the invisible girl by Cake Station soon. Sorry, I goofed my words in the middle of your super chat. <laughs> Hopefully soon. I have things that I'm working towards. I have a, I, I'm planning on having a whole month of Ruby fan animation reviews. Um, but I don't know what month is going to be. It's not going to be March, obviously, and it's not going to be April, and then it won't be May, because May is Magical Girl May. So I'm- hopefully it's going to be soon, but I- I have to figure out a good day for it. It'll happen sooner or later, but hopefully soon. I got a lot of stuff on my plate. <laughs> I've been- there's several fan animations I've wanted to talk about. Like, I wanted to talk about the pitch trailer for a long while now. Uh, there's a couple of other fanmations that have been popping up, like Evermorrow, and and all kinds of things. Um, there's this one animation series by so they're called Pulp Anime, is their name, and they've been doing Realm is their team. They have a fan team, fan OC team called Realm. I've been really enjoying their work lately. So I've, there's a bunch I want to talk about. I just need to get the time. <laughs> and I also want to go back to talking about Madoka Magica some more, and Legend of Korra some more, and I wanted to talk about Steven Universe too. There's too many things. Too many things and never enough time. That's my biggest problem, is that there's too many projects and, I, like, there's not enough existence for me to get all my projects done. <laughs> oh, we're back to Yang. We haven't seen her in episodes. It's been a long time since we've seen Yang. She's another one who gets, like, really... Like, like I was talking about with Weiss, it makes sense that Weiss's story is separated a lot throughout the volume because she has very minimal things to do. But I think with Yang, it's a bummer because I would have loved to see her on screen more because watching her... The last time we saw her, she had finally gotten to the point where she was comfortable putting the arm on. And now we're at the point where she's, like sending out haymakers, she's molly whopping her dad, and, like, I would have liked to see the growth, like, even just a montage of her getting better and better with the arm, to imply, like, it's, because it, it feels like it, it was, it's like, this wasn't a setback at all, you know, I, I, if your character is going to lose a limb and then get a new limb, even a small montage to show them getting used to it can show the leaps your character is growing, with that new element of their life. Having her just, like, missing that part of her development makes me wonder why did we do it plot-wise at all? Because that's kind of like the point of having a character lose an arm, is have, and then giving them a new robot arm is like, oh, now we will see them grow and develop, and then they'll be back to how they were eventually, and then even further beyond and whatever. But, like, writing-wise, I don't understand having your character lose a limb, and then skipping over the part where they have to get used to their new limb just to make it basically back to how they were before they lost the limb, you know? And Yang's arm is never a thing for her to worry about. She never has to worry about it, like, get, like, I, cause, cause, okay, I watched Danny Mata reacting to uh, Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood recently, and one of the things that I always think about is when they go to the cold place, Briggs, it's very cold in the north, and if you, like, metal, like, burns your skin if it's cold. Like, if you wear earrings in, like, snowstorms, it will really burn your ears and stuff like that. So you need to get special kinds of metal for your automail in-universe to help you with the cold so it doesn't burn you. That makes sense. But Yang never has to worry about that. We never talk about kind of setbacks like that. We don't talk about, like, you know, it's just anything with her robotic limb. And, uh, like, there are other things I can think of. Like, um, um, Tales from the Borderlands. Reese? Is that the character's name? The main dude? I think his name is Reese. He has a robotic eye and a robotic arm. And early in the game, 
your the other character can do a thing where in an attempt to like goof up his eye from noticing that the thing they're trying to scam him they're trying to make him not notice something's real or not and so they set off an EMP basically to like goof up his, the circuitry in his eye so he wouldn't notice but it also gets the circuitry in his arm because they didn't realize it was a prosthetic and his arm like freaks out momentarily and it makes him drop the thing so uh, like that was a plot point that only happened because of his robotic limb and they just don't play around with it with Yang at all and I feel like it's a missed opportunity. Like, if you have a character with a robotic limb, do more. Like, they do it, like, it is everybody. <laughs> like, Maria doesn't get x-ray vision or, like, heat vision or whatever with her robotic eyes. She just sees. Tyrion has a t robotic tail and they could do anything with it. But no, it's just still poison. Like, what was the point of, like, him losing his tail if they just remade the tail again? It's exactly the same. It's no different. It. I just don't get it. I, like, writing-wise, it feels like you're wasting a bunch of potential. Thank you again, Godzilla. I headcanon that Team Ruby is subbed to you and silently agree with you. <laughs> nice. I, I, I bet the, like, AU concepts where they're actresses is a lot of fun. And I've seen a lot of people talking about it now recently with um, the news about Rooster Teeth. And I always find that stuff fun, so... <laughs> Hell yeah. Yeah, Danny Mata, I've been watching his stuff lately. I found his work recently, and I was, uh... He, he's one of the better reaction channels I've ever seen. So, that's fun. <laughs> Thank you, Anton. About the two-hour mark... Oh, is it? Oh, dang, you're right. You got the likes and subscribing covered, so time for a hydration call. Really love the cute gremlin model. Happy to be catching a stream without having to work. Worry about work? Hell yeah. Yeah, I've, I'm gonna be doing Sunday streams from now on. Sunday and Monday. This week will be crazy, though. I'm gonna be streaming on Monday and Wednesday. And on Tuesday, I'll be doing a Team Jacked stream over on Celtic Phoenix's channel. So hopefully the Sunday, like, time slot can mean some other people can come check out the stream without interfering with work schedules or class schedules. Yeah, no tail gun. Dang. I never thought of that. Now I really want it. <laughs> Having it be like a, like a mini machine gun. Oh, damn. That's a good idea. <laughs> Oh, speaking of um, um, uh, schedules with this week, on Tuesday, tomorrow, on Monday, my patrons are going to get a new video that's uh, talking about something with Avatar The Last Airbender, and then it'll be available on Tuesday for everybody. So keep your eyes peeled, everyone. <laughs> Any plans for 60k subscribers? No, not really. Because, like, I don't know what to do. <laughs> I don't know what else I can do for, like, a big celebration like that. Maybe I'd wait for 100k. Um, I'm very appreciative. <laughs> like, I really, like, like it, it doesn't feel real to me. And maybe that's why I didn't think of anything. Because I'm like, that's not real. That can't be happening. <laughs> no way. Me? All I do is babble about cartoons I like. <laughs> or cartoons I don't like. That's what I do. <laughs> Good Last Airbender or Netflix Last Airbender? The Good Last Airbender. I had nothing to say about Netflix Last Airbender. It was fine. It, was, it wasn't It was great, but it was fine. Very mid. <laughs> okay, yeah, okay, all right. This is another one. We don't see Yang's training, but we get one instance of Weiss training. And also, it's only one instance right before she masters summoning. I just... <laughs> I don't, like, do, you not, do they not understand the point of training arcs? I know they've watched, like, Dragon Ball Z. They've talked about it before. Do they not understand the fun part of a training arc? If you just hand your characters new, uh, like, abilities. If you just, oh, like, here, oh, you can shoot lasers out of your eyes now. Like, oh, they, I said, okay. I said that as, like, a random not, ref, like, thing. But then I remembered Ruby actually can shoot lasers out of her eyes with her silver eye powers. <laughs> like, if they just hand their, like, and now you can summon. Oh, okay. 
You didn't have to fight for it. If there was any training or struggle, it happened all off screen. And now you just can do this because why not? <laughs> the, uh, uh, they get kind of better at it in volume seven. Like we see them in their training hologram room for a montage. So that's something, but especially here in volume four, it's so dumb. <laughs> It takes a lot of effort for Critter to have nothing to say. It was something I worried a lot about when I first started streaming. I was like, I'm not gonna have anything to say. It'll be just long moments of silence because I won't know what to start talk about. And it's, I'm a little nervous because usually if I do a watch along stream, I've done it so far only with things I've seen before. You know, I did a watch, oh, I guess with volume nine. No, no, I hadn't seen that one. Hmm. I'm just nervous because usually when I watch something, I don't really talk through it. I don't emote through it, which is why you won't see my face because I don't emote. <laughs> but so I'm excited to start doing watch along streams of things that I haven't seen before because I don't know what I'll talk about. <laughs> so why the Cyclops? Because uh, it felt pretty. <laughs> Aren't I pretty? I just really, I was sitting there and I'm like, I'm on a change and this is exactly what I want to change into. And it was just this, it was exactly this. And I, I think it's so pretty and cool looking. <laughs> you mean that supposed two month long training montage? I know, yes, it would be so easy too. <laughs> I don't understand, but we had to waste time with Blake talking to her dad or whatever. <laughs> Thank you again, Godzilla. They gotta rewatch the Kai training arc and see. Yes. <laughs> Going into their like training chamber. <laughs> I, it just makes no sense. They waste so much screen time. Uh, you know what? It does make sense because I know what the reason is. It's the same reason why the majority of this volume is characters barely moving. Like even this chase scene, they've moved like a little bit and then they stop and it's immediately they're done chasing each other. And I don't know why. And the reason why is because they didn't want characters moving. <laughs> they stand still and they don't move because that's easier to animate than a fight sequence. And that's why we skip Weiss's training arc. That's why they introduce summoning for Weiss in general. Because having her run around and slashing her sword is a lot harder to animate than having her stand still and point her sword like a wand. And then have some creature thing come out. It's a lot easier to have her stand still. And a lot of this volume, and especially a lot of volume 5, is the characters not moving at all and standing still. Because it was cheaper, faster, and easier for them to animate it that way. Because they were rushing everything out. And everything was at the last second. It's weird that it... Like, you can tell it was a problem with Volume 4, even though they took longer to produce- to, to They took longer to produce Volume 4 because they had to rebuild everything from the ground up, because they changed to the Maya engine. So they had to remake all these characters, all these locations, there's a lot of sets and scenery and things they had to remake because they were now doing it in a completely different animation engine. So I can understand why, oh, we'll have a lot less fight scenes, it'll be a lot more standing around, because then it'll be easier on us in the long run. But then with Volume 5, I really don't understand. They must have just gotten the biggest heads. Like, they must have gotten huge inflated egos, because... <sighs> Thank you, Overhypin! Hi! Hi, Critter! Just woke up and was happy. I didn't miss the stream, since I usually do. Nice! Hopefully I'll be doing uh, Sunday streams, so like how I am now. So hopefully you can catch those ones more often. It'll be uh, an opportunity. Hopefully. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> but yeah, like the thing is with, with, with volume five, they must have gotten such inflated egos because they rushed everything about the volume. Like they were exporting episodes hours before they were supposed to air. And it's like, no one forced them to do that. They weren't on a schedule set to them by some evil overlord. They made their own schedule. They set the schedule date and they started their production pipeline all on, the, uh, on their own accord. They made those decisions and it really, really hurt the production of Volume 5. Volume 5 suffered so much. Oh yeah, and Genlock. Ugh. <laughs> I thought Genlock was more of an effect on Volume 6. Or no, 
Genlock was airing during Volume 6. Yeah, Volume 5 suffered a lot because of the Genlock crap. We can really, we can, no matter what anyone says, the downfall of Rooster Teeth can really all be tracked back to Grey Haddock being a terrible piece of shit. <laughs> Grey stealing all these resources from Volume 4 and 5, mostly Volume 5. Grey spending buttloads of money the company didn't have on animating his very basic, simplistic, boring-ass mech anime. Getting a million big names for it. I can't imagine hiring David Tennant and Michael B. Jordan and all these other r really big actors to voice your characters in your stupid mech anime. Couldn't have been a cheap decision. <laughs> But he wanted his little anime th pet project to go, because why not? He was the one in charge of money, so might as well, right? If you're the one who says what the budget gets spent on, why wouldn't you try to make your own little basic bitch story concept a reality? Which I don't even think he was passionate about the mech anime genre. I don't think he was passionate about his own story or characters in the slightest. I think all he wanted was to get big names to attach to a project that had his name on it. Because that was the thing from the very beginning. Like, he talked once about how they wanted to get Sarah Silverman to voice Neo. Because back in the day, they were like, no, Neo's going to have a voice, we just haven't revealed it yet. And then later they, they retconned that, and they're like, actually, we decided she's mute. Uh, initially our plan was to have Sarah fucking Silverman voicing her. And I'm like, why? Out of all the actors or actresses in the world, why would you pick Sarah Silverman? She's not even a voice actress. Is it because she has a big famous name? And that 100% is the thing. Grey Haddock is in love with big famous names. And he likes slapping big famous names onto his products. But specifically big famous like face actors. Grey Haddock, uh, to me, seems like the person who doesn't respect voice actors at all. He, he's the kind of person who would sit there and go, Oh, but you're a real actor. Even though voice acting is real act acting. Um... And he didn't like the fact that, oh, Ruby's getting these voice actors, this anime voice actors, but uh, my, my, my mech one will have real actors, the big famousy famous names like Michael B. Jordan. And it's so dumb. You can tell he's just a passionless loser, greedy asshole <laughs> who tanked the entire company funding his product that he had no heart for, no care for, no energy, no love, no passion. He did it because he wanted his name to be next to other famous people's names. It's such- what a loser. What is that guy even doing these days? You know? <laughs> Grey Haddock sounds like a sketchy Ruby character. He sounds like one of the bandits from Raven's Tribe, right? <laughs> like, it sounds like it should be Shady Man and Grey Haddock. <laughs> Didn't Sarah Silverman do blackface? <laughs> I, that wouldn't surprise me. I bet they wanted- I bet he specifically wanted Sarah, because didn't she voice, um, the, uh, Penelope, Vanellope in Wreck-It Ralph? And so, like, oh, she can do the high-pitched little cute girl voice, and I bet that's what they were gonna ask her to do. Just do Vanellope's voice again for Neo. Because they're not creative. <laughs> F fitting that he voiced Roman, I know. And also, and you know what? And you know what? The, everyone else who's voiced Roman after him has done a better job with it. Like, 100%. <laughs> Even the brief instances of Roman popping up in Ice Queendom and also in the end of Volume 9. Infinitely better performances than what Grey was doing. What a loser. Fuck that guy. <laughs> I like I usually try to like tiptoe around like uh, insulting real people. Um like I'll call out when the writers make dumb bad decisions, but Grey Haddock 100% fuck that guy. <laughs> he seems like a loser and he's the reason Rooster Teeth has completely fallen apart by now. <laughs> we can't deny it. It's cuz he wanted Genlock and Genlock wasn't even that bad. Genlock was done with Blender, wasn't it? I'm pretty sure it was the Maya engine because I think no, I'm pretty sure it was the Maya engine. But you can tell they put more effort into that one because, like, there's more consistent shading 
in Genlock, but we can't do that for Ruby, the show that's already making the company a lot of money, but we'll dump all of our resources into his little pet project. <laughs> Yeah, Billy, Billy Kamitz. Gonna miss him. 10 out of 10. Great work. Ah. Yeah, he did great. And then the other fellow who voiced him after that also did great. I don't remember his name. I don't remember many people's names. <laughs> I have high respects for voice actors since that's something I want to do in the future. So anyone who doesn't respect them or say voice actors isn't real acting gets on my nerves. Yes. Yes, 100%. <laughs> Like, I, 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 I remember I was, like, in high school when I started paying attention to voice actors. And it was all really, like, like, once I started diving into it, I understood the complexity of being a voice actor. And so every time someone's like, I don't like the English dub, they just aren't as good. And I'm like, no, they are. They are good. You're just a weird Japanese weeaboo <laughs> who <laughs> likes pretending you are you can speak Japanese. <laughs> Because English voice actors do amazing jobs, and if you don't realize that, it's because you're not paying attention. Hello Critter, wanted to come sooner, but watched a Friends of Mine stream. That's okay. I'm always here. <laughs> Christopher Wetkamp. Yes. I feel like I said it wrong. <laughs> Thank you, Mystic Orange. That's very sweet of you. <laughs> Warner Bros. trying to sell Red vs. Blue is funny, because who the hell are you going to sell it to? Yeah. Also, Red vs. Blue is like, they're fan fiction with Halo characters. With like the licensing ar alone around doing that is so weird. It's fine. <laughs> like, Hello, Mystic Orange. Hi. <laughs> it's, it's, it's fine because the last season with Red vs. Blue is supposed to be the last season. Um, they always said, we'll keep making the show until people don't want to watch anymore. And I guess they got to the point where people don't want to watch. <laughs> So the last thing that they're going to release sooner or later, I d they don't ha they still don't release any dates for airing dates for their products still. <laughs> so once that's over, I don't think anyone's going to do anything red versus blue related after that. <laughs> like at that point, you could just make your own sci-fi story. It doesn't have to be red versus blue. Hell, red versus blue barely became was barely like its own story by the end of it there. Like, I didn't watch past volume, not volume, sorry. I didn't watch past season 10-ish with Red vs. Blue. Thank you again, Mystic Orange. <laughs> like, I didn't watch, like, a bunch of, uh, like, after season 10 of Red vs. Blue. I didn't watch it a bunch because I thought it was getting very boring and dumb. But I know by the end there, it was all completely different characters. I don't even think there were reds or blues anymore. And they weren't doing the AI plot anymore. So, like, why even bother keep calling it Red vs. Blue other than for, like, the name recognition, right? Because, <laughs> like, at that point, you could just do your own science fantasy thing. And also now they have, the like, Halo has its own TV show, right? Like, they are their own thing. So if you want something Halo related, they're already doing it. And if you want to do something like Red vs. Blue, it doesn't need to be Halo characters. Honestly, the Halo element of Red vs. Blue was only ever a limitation, not not something that benefited the plot. Hey, guys, look. Uh, Rooster Teeth doesn't know how to model children. <laughs> Baby Ren looks so weird. His face is, like, too big. Like, his head's too big. Also, I don't know what the voice actress voicing Little Ren is doing here. Like, they seem fine. I get the feeling maybe they thought Ren was a lot younger than he actually is here. Mm. <laughs> Critter, I remember you saying you didn't watch past season 11, but I do recommend watching seasons 12 through 13. Everyone said that, but I really hated season 11. You know, I'll go back. I'm sure I'll go back and watch it all eventually. Maybe I'll do that for a watch along sometime. Um, yeah, everyone was like, the, these seasons that Miles wrote for Red vs. Blue was so good. Why are the Ruby seasons so bad? And I remember just, I didn't, I really wasn't happy with season 11. I thought it was over dramatic and lame. And also, it didn't help that I really appreciated the AI plotline that had just wrapped up. Like, I thought that was way above and beyond and much more creative. And then everything that was going on with season 11 just wasn't doing it. You know, 
You remember 10 year old Cinder? Because I thought that was teen Cinder. She might be 10. It's hard to tell. <laughs> it's, it's, it's really hard to tell. Um, uh, what was I saying? Oh yeah, Ren's baby face. Like, I don't understand what his voice actress is doing. Like, she's, she, like, it sounds like she's doing a younger performance than what he looks like. But I'm not sure. Uh, they also, like, every time they've ever modeled a child, I'll get to it. Like, you can look it up, actually. Look up, um, thank you, Godzilla Slayer. Someone recreated the first episode of RBB in Helldiver. Nice. Fun. Cute. I like that. The why are we even here uh, monologue is a very iconic moment. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, you can look up um, Ozpin Ozma's Four Daughters Like, go to your phone Grab your phone or a screen of some sort And Google Ozpin's Four Daughters The oldest one You could tell they only modeled one of them And then just scaled their entire bodies To different sizes To be the other three because the oldest daughter, I think it's the one with blue, the blue dress, her head is like five times the size of Ozma's head. Because they scaled her entire model rather than just her body, like her, her torso section of her model to make her look taller than the other sisters. So her head is like three times the size of Ozma's whole head. Because they did the whole body that way. And they've always struggled with children. Every single time. They've just completely struggled with children. <laughs> uh, in volume 9, when we see Summer reading like a fairy tale book. The Ever After fairy tale book to the girls. You can tell they made a new model for Yang. But they just reused Ruby's volumes 4 through 5. 4 through 6 model for Ruby. Like, her kid version, Sleeping Under the Covers. And it's very weird. And I don't understand <laughs> why they made these decisions. <laughs> yeah, Nora needs Tide. That's why we're getting all the Tide commercials. Because Nora needs more Tide. <laughs> I love your channel. I'm obsessed with your channel. Thank you, Mystic Orange. That's nice. I try. I do a lot and I try. <laughs> Little child. Saki, please. Everyone else. How are you so cute? It is a very cute line delivery. That moment is definitely, like, one of the cutest moments. Especially for Ren. <laughs> also, okay, okay alright. This is Kaiji Tang voicing uh, Lee Ren right here. That's Ren's dad. Lee. <laughs> Grab your phone. Don't you have phones, guys? Critter24. That's me. Because, <laughs> like, I don't want- I never want to assume. But also, I think it's safe to assume that there's some sort of screen. <laughs> so yeah, Kaiji Tang is voicing Lee. Kaiji Tang is a huge voice actor. He's awesome. He does, like, everything you could think of. He's in a lot of Fire Emblem. Um, he's a really big name voice actor. So it's so weird they got him to do one scene. Like, he, he has, like, five lines of dialogue total. And he nails it. He does a fantastic job. Especially with the take action son moment. But it's so weird that, like, like why not use him more? <laughs> I guess it could be worth- what do you do? Spend millions of dollars to get David Tennant and other huge names for your stupid mech anime? Or do you spend money to get a high-profile voice actor for only one scene? Who knows? <laughs> Which one's the worst decision? Why is Rooster Teeth failing? We'll never know! <laughs> ah yes, let's leave the sad orphan girl alone. Her emotions won't attract any Grimm. Yeah! Yes! Is that what attracted the Grimm to the town? I don't think so. Like, that- just for Nora's sanity, I don't think so. But- I, Okay, the whole Grimm being attracted to negative emotions thing is so situational. It only happens in very, very, very specific moments that, like, uh, will benefit the plot. But... But... Like, in-universe, I remember, like, Fat Man Falling had a, a big section of his Volume 3 review was talking about how the tournament arc makes no sense because having, like, competitions and fights in-universe 
would yeah they also did it with amber you're right <laughs> having it be in universe like in universe like that kind of thing can really like spark negative emotions like thinking about like the fallout to when like football games happen also the lack of detail ren being fully dressed on top of the covers like it's a small thing and i understand why they don't go the effort of giving him like a pajama outfit or trying to model him under the covers it's a small thing that wasn't necessary, but it definitely highlights how they're rushing elements of the plot. Like, like those little extra- like, I was talking about it last time, that they don't go the extra effort of having, like, alt versions of their outfits. They don't engage with, like, props in the story a lot. They don't touch things very often. And it very much feels like, like, the characters are existing on top of the world. And the characters exist solely for the sake of churning out the, the story. They don't feel like real characters. They don't feel like they live in this world. They l feel like excuses for the plot to be told to us. And it's a little disappointing because it would be a little bit extra work to do something like giving Ren pajamas. But it would be a nice extra detail that really elevates things in the long run. Like when we saw Team Ruby wearing uh, like their school uniforms or their pajamas back in volumes one, like, you know, like that's a nice detail. Yes, they wouldn't go to bed in their battle uniforms. No, they, they wouldn't go to classes in their battle uniforms. Having a uniform, having pajamas, having things like that is a nice little detail that makes it feel like a real world, feeling more lived in. And the fact that they they really gave up on that idea with volumes four onward. It really with volumes three onward. Because like that we don't see them in we see them in pajamas briefly in volume uh seven. But you can tell like they made one character model and then just copy and pasted the different girls' heads because all the girls' boob size are the same as each other. <laughs> And I think also all of their, like, body proportion, like, their, their heights are the same as each other. But whatever. We don't need Ren pajamas when we got him in a towel. I... Yes. Yes. <laughs> I like how they never in-universe showed Ren's pajamas, but they did show Ren in a towel. <laughs> but yeah, little things like that. It's, it's just, like, like, it would be a nice way to, like, help with the story a little bit more. A nice little extra detail. And they just, like, the fact that they don't go the extra mile for those smaller things is disappointing. When, especially, like, I'm watching, I, I finished watching Avatar Last Airbender, they have all kinds of different moments where their outfits change, or they take off, like, extra layers if they don't need to, or they change their hair and things like that. And, like, especially for little moments like this, just having that extra little detail. Like, the fact that they can't even animate Nora, like, sitting. Like, she's in a squat position because they didn't go the detail of having her kneel at all. Because that would be slightly more effort for their animation model to go through. It's just, it feels, it makes the show feel that much lazier. And it's not important. Like, it's not gonna, it doesn't change the overall quality of the story ex itself. But it is a nice thing, like every now and then to have things like that. And they really, and I was, I, and I bring it up so much because it was, a, they really went ham with it in the beginning. Like volumes one and two, especially, they would really play around with things like that. Like think about them in the library. Like they're all playing their board game while Juniper are all doing different things in the background. And they just don't have those nice little details anymore. And it's a shame that they were so good at it beforehand to have, given up on the idea so much recently. To have gone the easier, lazier route, you know? So. That's where we're at. <laughs> Need some more hydration. Stay hydrated. So the thing is, okay, I like the Knuckle Avi. It took until the 10th episode to really show it, you know, to really, really set it up. I feel like this should have been a lot more of the volume, but we spent uh, most of our screen time on Blake and her stupid story. <laughs> Thank you again, Sora. I always thought Team Juniper sharing a room is weird. Ah, like I get it. Like, it's fine. <laughs> They're respectful boys. It's, it's whatever. <laughs> 
you know, you get a lot of choices, like when you're running around camping, saving, like running for your lives to save the day. Not much, you don't really get a lot of options. <laughs> Moral of the story, manage your time and resources better. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Because also, because a lot of things like, oh, they didn't have the time. They already, and I, like I was saying, they had to rebuild everything in this universe from the ground up. So they didn't have the time or resources, maybe not the budget. And that's one thing. But you can. There are ways of doing it. Maybe instead of, I don't know, wasting a lot of time on Blake having a useless conversation with her dad about nothing important. Maybe, instead, use that time to model baby Ren in pajamas, you know? I also feel- I, 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 It's whatever. It's all in hindsight, too, you know? It's a lot of Ruby is in hindsight. Just like we're talking about any show. But it's, it's easy to see these things with Ruby. I think that's the biggest thing. People who talk about how, oh, there's so many- there's so many criti criticisms and critiques about Ruby. It's not fair. And I think the thing is, Ruby's really easy to see the critiques for. Like, it's really easy to watch Ruby, and in hindsight, you go, well, this could have been better. Be just by the way it's been written. It's just very, very easy to see the flaws. So I don't think it's that there's just more criticism criticisms of the show, because, ooh, the, all the big, mean, scary internet people are being mean about your show that you like. I think it's just easier to notice these things if you give it a little bit of extra thought. I mean, they're teens, though. No hide the bottle. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Shame his wife didn't have any aura since she got killed by some falling debris. I, is, okay, so yeah, that's another thing. Like, they show you can unlock aura. Like, Pyrrha does it. And they did it because it was cool. They've said that before. They, they just thought it was a cool sounding thing for her to do. And yeah. But also, now it's like, shouldn't everyone have that? Would you not unlock your baby's aura right away? It doesn't seem to hurt or anything. It just happens. Like, everyone should be having their aura getting unlocked all the time. No matter if they're, like, a huntsman or not. Especially if it's as easy as that. <laughs> but whatever. This isn't- oh yeah! I was like, wait a minute. This isn't the second to last episode. I thought there was 12. There are 12 episodes in volume four. I just always forget that vol that episode 11 exists because it's such a non-episode. Nothing happens in this stupid episode. Nothing happens that couldn't have happened sooner. It's so, ugh. <laughs> it's just, it's just, oh my God. They always do that too. They, they, like this is the beginning of them really relying heavily on the what'll happen next cliffhangers for Ruby. Because nothing happens all episode. And then, at the very end, they'll start to maybe do something. And then they'll be like, oh, but what's going to happen? Come back next week to find out. And then they, they, whatever they do that was their cliffhanger, it gets resolved instantly at the beginning of the next episode. And then they do nothing for the rest of the episode. And then they do it again at the end, especially in volumes five and six. Volume seven gets it a little bit too, but... Oh, nice. They don't even, like, subtitle the, like, lyrics to the song. It just says that it's playing Let's Just Live. <laughs> nice. Nice extra detail. Good job, Rooster Teeth. Nice attention. <laughs> Thank you again, Mystic Orange. Thank you. <laughs> You're so nice. You don't gotta do that. <laughs> do you think Rooster Teeth was laundering money because of all the laundry ads? <laughs> Forgot to say, but I love your Cyclops form. Thank you. I love it. I'm so happy with it. I haven't checked Twitter since I started streaming. But I hope people like it. <laughs> I'll post the whole picture, the whole outfit, onto Twitter after we're done streaming Volume 4. Um, so you can get a good look at all the perfect details. I'll also post Flumbo and Peekaboo on there as well. <laughs> wow, Cinder, we haven't seen you since, like, 
ever. I think the last time we saw Salem and Cinder on screen was episode two? Maybe? No. Episode three. I remember. It was the very first episode we watched. It was her, like, doing her thing with Cinder's arm. Whatever. And nothing happens. The seer Grimm floats in and nothing happens. But, like... It, it's weird. And then she vanishes for the entirety of the volume. And then in the second to last episode, it's like, oh, wait, remember? These two exist. The two main villainesses. Because let's be real. They are going to be the main final bosses for the show. Salem and Cinder. Let's, uh, maybe we should go back to their development at all. Again, we miss Cinder's development. She has her own, like, training arc. I, I don't know why Rooster Teeth are so bad at training arcs. <laughs> That's the fun part about having your characters train, is watching them get better at it. <laughs> like, imagine if Avatar Aang was just like, I need to learn earthbending. And Toph's like, okay, yeah, just do this. And then he just did it immediately. Wow, what a great episode. <laughs> like, they don't do that because they understand the training part is the fun part of watching your characters train. <laughs> That's the whole point. I don't... Uh, whatever. Like, we, we could have hinted towards Cinder's voice coming back more. <sighs> whatever. <laughs> they really dropped the ball a lot with Cinder. A lot of the villains. I've talked at length about the villains. You all know. <laughs> first half of Ruby Volume 6 was the best the show's ever gotten. I love Volume 6. It's my second favorite, I think. Episode, volume 3 is my favorite, but Volume 6 is also really good. The apathy arc. Everyone said it was filler, but you know what? It's good filler. It's that good stuff that I want to see. Because you remember when Ruby was really good? It was when it had a lot of filler arcs. <laughs> a lot of filler episodes. And that's the thing. These episodes with these volumes, you could sit there and say it's filler. The thing, it's not filler. They're trying to move the plot forward. And they're trying to, like... i sorry. I remember I, when Twins did a video with you and Allison. I keep remembering where a customer kept breaking her water bottle from RT. Sorry if I'm off topic. Oh, yeah, I remember us talking about that once. Yeah. <laughs> The thing is, yeah, volume four, it's not a filler arc with volume four. It's just slow. It's all, but there's a constant exposition and constant hinting at things moving forward. The thing is, you can't skip volume four because the small little things that they're constant, that they're dragging out across the volume is important in the long run. It's just very slowly done. V and people saying the apathy stuff was filler, I don't think it is, because we also get a lot of important stuff there. But also, it's the most fun part of the whole show. <laughs> it's the characters just being the characters. One small episodic problem for them to solve. That's... That, that, yes. <laughs> that's, that's the kind of thing a lot of characters strive on. And I think the fact that Ruby doesn't do that... Like, having episodic... Like, like a beginning, middle, and end per episode... I think would benefit Ruby. But it's hard to tell, you know? <sighs> or at least, like, every couple of episodes having a beginning, middle, and end. Which is how the which is how the show initially started. Like, in volumes one through three, every two to three episodes would be a, a mini arc. But they abandoned that here with volume four onward. And I think it they shot themselves in the foot that way. I think instead they tried having like character specific arcs that stretch all four stretch across the volume, but it makes the beginning and middle of the whole volume feel like nothing is happening. They feel very empty. And then it feels like suddenly everything starts to happen at the very end. And <laughs> like you can have like volume long arcs for the characters, but I think it's still important to have things periodically happening throughout the volume as well. And there just isn't enough of that in Ruby. I like how the landscapers have been outside for hours. They've been outside the entire time I've been streaming. <laughs> Struggle to see how the apathy arc is filler. It gives the main characters more development in two episodes than all of five. It's true. And that's another thing with like little episode mini arcs like that, whether it's episodic or like two to three episode arcs, it's just a nice little way to, like, show 
growth for a character. Uh, just a little bit of development. Because they start with a problem, and then an episode or two later, they resolve their problem. With Ruby, it they fundamentally miss sections of that. There's no beginning, middle, and end. There'll be a beginning and an end, and usually there's no middle. And the problem is the middle is usually the fun part of the story. You know? As we, like, we spend a lot, a lot, like, the beginning is short, and then the end is short, but the majority of the story is always the middle, and that's where Ruby doesn't do that. Instead, they fill their middle with wandering exposition and pointless dialogue and nothing happening. <laughs> it, the thing, it's not, the stuff in the middle is not related to the things that they did in the beginning, you know? It's, I, <sighs> I hate this. What a not, con like, cliffhanger. Are you going to- We're springing this on Yang right now at the very end. Are you gonna go look for your mommy? Or are you gonna go look for your sister? What is she going to do? Come back next volume to find out. And then it's like, I don't care. <laughs> like, like, why can't she just tell us? Like, the fact that Rooster Teeth does this a lot, where the volume ends with so many cliffhangers and, like, questions up in the air that it's impossible to predict what could happen with the next volume. And so usually it just feels pointless. Like, like having- if Yang said, I'm going to find Ruby, then I would have something to look forward to. But the answer to a question of a small character arc is not a thing that makes me look forward to something. You know? And Ruby does that a lot. Ruby's been impossible to predict the next volume for, for a very long time. You know? Like, it's like, like especially like, oh, they fell into the ever after. What's gonna happen? Who knows? Who fucking knows? <laughs> Anything could happen. And it's been that way for so long. So yeah, I, and I, I hate the way that it's presented, like, those are her only options. I wish she would have talked about it. That's another thing. Like, Yang doesn't express that she wants to do that. Uh, we also, like, why is Weiss... Uh, why is Weiss breaking out now? Why didn't she jump out a window? She broke her window in the last episode we saw her in, implying that she was going to be leaving through that window. Just summon a bee. Just make a big bee summon and jump out the window and fly away. Why is she sneaking out in the middle of the night? It's just, I don't... Uh, <laughs> I think it was an excuse to get her to hear this conversation. And I guess the embargo becomes kind of important later. I don't know. Like, I guess it's setting up Ironwood. Oh, look, he's going to become a villain eventually. But we kind of knew that already. It's because all volumes, the only thing we've seen Ironwood do is be cool and side with Weiss. And then they're like, oh no, we want him to be like a bad guy later. We should remind people that sometimes he makes rash decisions because... Uh. <laughs> Ugh. Ugh. This is the thing. Volume 4 is not bad. I've gone back and forth. When it was coming out, I hated it. I really hated Volume 4 when it was first airing. For good reason. It was slower than ever before. It was really boring. The animations are surprisingly way less quality. Like, everyone moves much floatier. Everyone's actions is just a little bit slower. Um, they, there's not a lot of background music. <laughs> the songs aren't very great in this volume. There's one or two good ones. Like, uh... This Life is Mine, that's a great one, but most of it's kind of bad, and there's very few fights, and the majority of them aren't that impressive. So yeah, when Volume 4 was coming out, I really hated it. It seemed like such a, a drop in quality from Volume 3, and I was really hoping it was just growing pains. Like, like oh, they, they changed to the new engine, and now they have to go through a whole new process of trying to figure out the show without Monty there. I was hoping it was just growing pains as they figured out what they were going to be doing. But now in hindsight, I'm like, you know what, Volume 4 isn't that bad. It has some really high highs. The good moments are really good. The bad moments are very boring and bad. But this is far from the worst. And it wasn't growing pains. <laughs> it wasn't growing pains. This was them coming into their own. This was them, like, realizing what their style was actually going to be. Because this is a lot closer to what the show typically looks like 
moving forward than anything else. Which is a shame. Very simple. Every location is a huge empty room. Characters barely touch or engage with props or walls or other characters. Everyone moves very slowly and floaty. The lighting is very boring. Even though they have dynamic lighting now. Like, you can see it. Especially in, like, the trailer. There's dynamic lighting and shading. That's crazy. That's so cool. But everything feels more flat than ever before. Because the lighting hardly ever affects characters' faces or their hair. They kind of just feel like they're pasted over the environments. <laughs> and and also the, the way they've modeled everything, all the colors are solid flat colors. Like, there's no fade effects anymore on, like, characters' hair or clothes. It's just a solid color. And so there's that. Like, you can see it here. Like... Blake has no shadows on her, the white of her coat. So she just feels like this solid blob on screen. Especially compared to the dynamic shading in the room around her. And there's just a lot of disconnect. I prefer the way volumes 1 through 3 looked because... At least then, like you could talk about how it technically looked worse, but at least then it had a style and everything looked like it matched. Like, the characters look like a part of the world, and in the Maya engine, they don't. They look awkwardly pasted on top of it. They float weirdly above their environments and props, and it's disappointing. Yeah, time to yell at Sun again. Ellie, he's like, why is she mad at him? Uh, Boo-hoo, everyone always gets hurt around me. Yeah, because you run away. <laughs> she constantly makes the bad decisions. And while everyone else is running after her, trying to help her and support her, she sits there and whines and cries because they end up getting hurt because she isn't there to take the damage for them. <laughs> she doesn't help people. She's a bad character. She's an annoying person. <laughs> Like, Sun is going through so much, and even now, in this moment, where she's trying to be all boo-hoo, poor me, everyone gets hurt around me, she still has to put him down and yell at him at the same time. And it's like, I, like, we can talk about shipping Sun and Blake. And initially, there are a lot of things that make it seem like Sun might have been attracted to Blake. This is the scene where I personally headcanon, he stops feeling that way for her. Like, his affection, romantically, is completely gone in this moment. Because he's realizing that she is more of a selfish individual than he initially thought. Like, she always puts him down. Even in this moment where he's, like, hurt. And he is, he's hurt because he was helping her. She's still yelling at him. And I feel like at that moment, that would be when I stopped loving someone. My crush would go away. And it would be just business. It's this little look he gives her right here. He, like, glances at her. Yeah, like, that's not- that's like, alright, time for business now. <laughs> Blake's character arc is just her playing the victim card. It's true. She doesn't do it. Not, I, I, it's so true. <laughs> she doesn't do anything. Her Everyone else gets hurt. And then she acts like she's the one who, who's suffering. Oh, everyone gets hurt around me. Then stand up for them. <laughs> Don't run away like a baby. <laughs> for a cat, she's kind of a bitch. Oh, oh, you're right. <laughs> Blake is the friend who says, everyone leaves me. And then there's always a good reason for why no one wants to stay around them. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> Blake literally slapped the feelings out of him. Yes. <laughs> You won't have a crush on me anymore. Bam, bam. The moment where Kali fails to eavesdrop, I had canon Kali is in love with Sun. Okay. <laughs> a lot of people do that ship. I don't blame them. I don't personally see it. But good for you. This is also a horrible moment. Why just... I, I know why. Why just Ren's face? It's because it was easy to animate. And they ran out of time and money. And every single decision that you sit there and go, why did they make that decision? It's because it was a cheaper, lazier, easier option for them. You can tell way back as early as volume four, they have been bending over backwards to produce the show in the laziest way possible. They have half-assed the show so much for so long 
and it's especially start. We can we can watch the intro, especially starting with volume four. Like they half-ass, and it's so weird to me. It makes no. We're on the last episode. We're on the last episode, guys. <laughs> it's so weird to me because Ruby is their biggest cash cow. Was sorry. <laughs> The rooster's dead. <laughs> it was their cash cow. Ruby was the thing making them the most money. And yet, as it was getting more and more popular, they were putting less and less effort into it. They were trying to... I guess they assumed if they put less time and effort, it would stay just as popular, and they would get more money for less time and budget. But they didn't realize that when you put less time and budget into something, the less effort you put into something, the worse it gets. Like, they set expectations very high for Volumes 1 through 3, especially Volume 3. And then with these, with Volume 4 onward, they half-ass things, they rush things, uh, and they it really, really, really hurts the show and the audience's perspective of the show. A lot of people stopped after Volume 4, and then um, the majority of people stopped after Volume 5. Like, like uh, perception of the show plummeted. They weren't getting as much money from it anymore. People weren't watching it as much. And while people were watching it, the general, like, the reviews were down. It wasn't as good as it used to be, you know? So And people, like, yeah, people were watching it, but it also came with a lot of critique and criticism, which is not a good look for your show. Something I don't believe. I'm gonna, hold on. <laughs> It's the Wikipedia Wikipedia article for Ruby. It says it's getting it got generally positive reception for every volume. I don't think that's true at all. <laughs> I, it, it really like I don't know where they're getting that information based off of. Like volume five did not get generally positive reception. What episode are we on? We're on the last one. This is episode twelve. No safe haven. We just started it. An example of success makes you lazy? Yes. There's two different people in this world. Some people where success makes them lazy. And they feel like they could... They they forget the effort they put in that led to their success. And then there's the other type of people in this world where success strikes a fire in you. And you do even more than ever before. And those people are always very stressed and they never calm down and they never really... Like, look at the thing that gave- they never really see their success as success because they're always striving to do more. Versus the other person who gets success and then assumes they're infallible and everything they touch is gold. And they assume that they can half-ass things and be lazy and they will still always reach those levels of success because they made it already. But who knows? Did you cut out? It wasn't me. I hope it wasn't me. My my frame rate has been pretty consistent this whole time. I was worried because it was a little cloudy today, and I'm like, it would definitely rain, <laughs> and I would lose power if I didn't make a schedule. Nothing would be would have gone wrong. But I know the moment I made a schedule, everything's going to go wrong. The moment the my scheduled times happen. <laughs> Did Volume 5 get good receptions? No! Like, generally, no. The whole- everyone, even the most, like, loving Ruby fans will admit that Volume 5 is the worst one. On, like, it, it, everything about it. Volume 5 was a mess on so many levels. I remember people defending Volume 5. Yeah. Yes. Yes. A lot of, like, like the, the ones that are, like, desperate for it to still be good, and they don't want to, like, admit that the volume clearly was suffering a lot. That's when I, I that's when I think the birth of the toxic Ruby fans really started. The 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 toxic fandom really was born out of Volume Five's badness, <laughs> because they have to really go to war to try to defend the show on top of its incredibly obvious failing, <laughs> failing volume. <laughs> oh, I remember Volume Five was the first time I left a comment on a Rooster Tooth video. It was on their website. I, I hadn't commented on their uh, videos before, just because I didn't feel like I really needed to. But volume five, finally, 
was the first time. I don't even remember which episode it was. It might have been The More the Merrier. But I finally left a comment and it was just talking about how disappointed I was in all of it. And how it was bad and it was lazy <laughs> and it was a bad, bad, bad show. And I was disappointed that they had taken this product that was so good and was doing the least amount of effort towards it. And yet they sit there and like they 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 praise it constantly. They had so many trailers and whatever, and they're like, "Oh, it's the best. Look, it's a real anime in Japan." And so they go to Japan and it's like, "Oh, look at our real anime and ooh, we're we're so popular and perfect." Now they sit there and gas it up a bunch, and then you watch the the stupid volume and it's like it's horrible. <laughs> if you spent half as much time working on the volume as you do running around in Japan, Wasting company money on a on a ticket to Japan to act like your web series is an anime. What was I watching? Oh, who was it? I looked up somebody who... It was Yuri Lowenthal. I looked up Yuri Lowenthal because it was his birthday recently. And I was looking him up on Wikipedia to see everything he had done. And because, you know, Wikipedia sections off different categories. And it was uh, film and then TV and then video games, and then at the very end, there was web series. And that's where Ruby was. That was where his credit for Mercury for Ruby was. Wayne, it's not a movie, it's not a TV show, it's not an anime, it's not any of these things that they really want Ruby to be, it's a web series. It, you're a YouTube video series. You are a web series. <laughs> so you can sit there and be like, no, it's a really for reals anime, but it's not. You're a web series. S just trapped, imprisoned on this subpar website where you have no benefits and no incentive to give them money. Like, being a first member is so not worth it. Other than watching the episodes early to avoid spoilers. But, like, it, if, you, if you can avoid it, it's fine. You don't need to worry about it. Yeah, Luna and Zek had a video where they found the DVD of Volume 1 in a Walmart, and I get they felt kind of starstruck then, but the Japan trip was just self-indulgent. It was. That whole video was so, like, oh, but we're special. Look at our special anime, guys. <laughs> it was just such a, like a, like a, uh, look at me, I'm so special, important video. And it's like, why? You have no humility? You're not gonna be humble at all? <laughs> Uh, whatever. But yeah, like I, the like, keeping Ruby, Ruby should have gotten picked up. Oh. Okay, Ruby should have gotten picked up by a company, a, a real company. It should have been put on a real website. It should have been airing on a real streaming service because keeping it imprisoned on Rooster Teeth's website is such a bad idea. And you think, oh, Warner Brothers bought them out. they That's the money they were looking for. But I guess not. <laughs> I don't know. Or they could have stayed indie, kept everything on YouTube, and did what Try Guys is doing. Where they have, like, sponsorship deals. And they have their Patreon and all those things. But no. Rooster Teeth wanted to be both camps. It wanted to be the indie little self-made scrappy team who did it themselves and also they wanted to be the uh, professional really done for realsies real anime that's all professional and stuff and you can't be both and because they kept trying to do it both ways they got no money out of it whatever <laughs> the Nekalavi fight I like the Nekalavi's design a lot it's really cool the fight is the best of the volume? No, it's not. It's the Tyrion fight. Tyrion's fight is the best of the volume. The Nekalavi is cool, but simplistic. They beat it a little too easily. After our big um, uh, Nora gassing up Ren moment. Like, it's a little too easy after that. And I don't know, like, and it's like 90% of this episode isn't even, like, anything. It's Ruby's letter to home that goes nowhere. Because you can tell they didn't actually care about Ruby writing a letter. They just wanted Ruby to monologue, to be like, look at how far we've come this volume. Because they realized nothing happened this volume. 
Wait, are the t- Tide ads technically sponsorships? I don't think so. Because, like, you, they're not sponsored or anything. They're just ads. Like how you have ads on YouTube, for example. Um, the thing is, like, with a sponsorship, you would be getting a lot more direct money. You know? Uh, you also get extra money because if you do a sponsorship, and especially with something like, oh, go to this website and put in you know, Rooster Teeth 12 and you get a deal, then you get extra money from things like that. Um, just ads don't work that way. It's slightly less money. But whatever, they wanted to act like Ruby was a for realsies real anime airing on TV, but they were keeping it on their indie little website and insisting it was a small indie project. So it lived and died by their own hubris, basically. More likely they were a big group of ads RT got and tied us for some reason the bulk of them. Yeah, I don't know why. It might just be me. Like, if you all go to the episodes, do you all get only tied ads? Is it something with my computer? Like, like my algorithm or whatever? Because <laughs> aren't commercials supposed to be, like, tailored to match you? Or whatever, based off of your search history? I don't know. I don't look up Tide. <laughs> it might be the saying where because I get Tide ads and I keep sitting here and saying I'm getting Tide ads, the like government FBI following me people are like, she keeps saying Tide ads. Give her more Tide. <laughs> and so it's it's my own downfall. <laughs> it's my own hubris. <laughs> Yeah, we okay. Every time they kill a Grim, I like how this is one of the few times where Big Grim is like the final fight for the volume. It happens very rarely, surprisingly, despite Grim being the like in universe threat for characters to deal with. But you know, it's weird that I, I like it a lot. It's very cool. It's weird that in most recent things with Ruby, they act like Ruby going off to fight the Grim is like some big to do. It's specifically in the Justice League Part 2 movie, where Ruby's, like, really throwing herself into fighting Grimm, and they're getting all pissy about it, the rest of Team Ruby. They're like, we are doing too much, and it's like, that's what you became Huntresses for. Like, are you stupid? Why did you become a Huntress if you didn't think you'd be going out and killing the Grimm? This is not- I was talking about it with Team Jack last last Tuesday as well, where- Another ad already? <laughs> Are you butt fucking me? Okay, it, they didn't play. <laughs> yeah, I was talking with Team Jack last Tuesday. We were on volume eight talking about the bumblebees, and we see Team Jolly going out to fight Grim, and they kill one Terrex. And then they're like, "Oh, we did it!" And then Fiona calls and is like, "Okay, now there's more Grim." And they're like, "Oh." Boo, this is tough. This is no fun. Lame. This isn't as fun as I wanted it to be. And it's like, that's why you became huntsmen. That's why you became huntresses. That's why you became hunters. (laughs) That was the whole point. (laughs) That was the whole point. Why are you bummed out that you have to kill Grimm when your whole job you've been dedicating your studies and training to this whole time is about killing the Grimm? (laughs) So I'm gonna, I, here's a fun thing uh, it's about my AU. It's not deep. <laughs> it, it, so my thing is I'm gonna change the way, so in universe they say huntsmen and then they say huntresses. I'm gonna change it in my AU story. So it, where they say hunters and hunters is the gender neutral one. And then if you're specifically talking about like male identifying, it's huntsmen. And if you say female identifying, it's huntresses. But uh, Hunters is going to be, like, the the baseline for gender-neutral versions. So then also, if you're a gender-neutral person and you don't want to go with the male or female-identifying one, you can just call yourself a hunter. This is a thing I've thought of before, and I was like, people are going to think I'm just wrong. <laughs> because I used to say hunters every now and then, and it would be, people would be like, no, it's huntsmen. And I'm like, I forget, but now I'm doing it on purpose, and they'll be like, actually, you got it wrong. They're not called hunters, they're called huntsmen. And I'm like, no, I'm, I'm doing it on purpose now. I'm doing a thing. <laughs> I use hunters too when collectively referring to like team ranger. Yes. Yeah. 
Because I remember that was a thing. Uh, d uh, uh, did you see that? Hold on, hold on. Look at the subtitle when Nora leans her head on Ren. The subtitle says, aww. Yeah. Is that like a, like a, whoever wrote the subtitle did that? I know that was a thing they did with uh, Ruby Chibi, was you had to turn the subtitles on and the subtitles would be crazy. Like they would have like a commentary on what was happening and there was like a whole other layer of jokes happening with the subtitles on. I know that was a thing with Ruby Chibi. I don't think they did anything like that for Ruby proper. But that awe implies that maybe every now and then? I haven't seen anything. Though I will be honest, I haven't really been paying attention to their subtitles the entire time. So I'm not entirely sure. <laughs> it makes sense to differentiate them from normal animal hunters, but I still like it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> With the asterisks. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, you, you see what I mean. Like, that makes sense, right? You understand what I'm saying? <laughs> God, I hate Home. I, of all of Ruby's songs, I like the majority of them, and the ones I don't like, I'm usually just neutral. Also, I hate this. There's too many things I hate. I can't keep up with it all. Why is there nothing in Ruby's window? There's just- it's- they're just grayed out. Like, if you didn't want to show what was outside the room, have blinds drawn. Don't just have windows that are completely grayed out. She just exists in a void. <laughs> Gee, they never designed any of Haven, could you tell? <laughs> Can't wait to see Haven next time where there's absolutely nothing except for those paper people. That 2D images <laughs> that they looked at. Yeah, and Ruby's letter. I hate- okay. Uh, ah, and then I hate home. I'm neutral about most of Ruby's songs. If I don't love them, then I'm usually neutral. Very few of them I hate, and home is one of them. I hate home. It's so try-hard. Like, it's trying to pull at your heartstrings, but nothing happened to deserve this. Thank you, Viva Voxy. Thank you. <clears throat> In Volume 8, when Yang flips the bike with Oscar on it, the subtitles say Epic Guitar Solo. No, it does not. It says Epic Guitar Solo? No way. <laughs> is that cool or is that dumb? <laughs> I can't decide. I guess... It's both, if I can't decide. <laughs> like, on one hand, I think that's fun for subtitles to be a bit more uh, interesting. But also, I don't know. I don't, okay, I, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna say it's cool. I'm gonna, I'm gonna land on, I think it's a cool one. <laughs> Why can't I see what's on the screen? Because I don't want a copyright strike. <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> Also, I can't remove the subscribe button. You need to hit the subscribe button and like and leave a comment. Thank you. Stay hydrated. <laughs> okay, all right, all right. Hey, this is another thing. Ruby's not right-handed. She's left-handed. They've said that before. In volume one, she was exclusively seen. No, not exclusively. I guess she writes. No, maybe. I don't remember. When she throws her pencil across the room when Weiss wakes her up. She might be writing with her other hand. But I'm pretty sure they said she's right. She's left-handed. But also... But also, this whole, like, ending monologue she's doing, just like the song Home, it's not deserved. Like, having Ruby warble out these, like, twee, boo, we just have to keep, we have to try, I fully believe in the heart of the cards, bleh. Like, having her do that doesn't make me feel like she's actually developed at all. Like, this volume is pretty minimalistic let's let's be honest it's a lot of very simple challenges if any for the characters to face basically this volume is yang decides to leave yang decides to start doing something weiss decides to start doing something blake decides to start doing something oscar decides to start doing something and ruby made it to her destination ruby Ruby's plotline is an uber drive. Like, nothing really developed for anybody. So to have her have this huge big monologue is so buffoonish. <laughs> it just highlights how little they actually did, which I think they were trying to do the opposite. I think they were really trying to convince us 
that, oh, look, they didn't uh, model Menagerie, so everyone, everything has to happen on this rooftop in Menagerie because they couldn't be bothered to model a single other location. It, it, it just, I feel like they felt like this monologue was going to convince the audience that a lot has happened. The characters have grown a lot and developed a lot. They, they were really moving forward, but all it really does is highlights how they're not. <laughs> it just highlights how little they've actually accomplished this volume. Especially Ruby getting all like sad and crying. Oh, I'm sad because my friends died. You haven't done anything. Like her, her nightmares stopped in episode two. It's not going anywhere. You're just, it's just a try hard. She's a try hard. And also her face is ugly. We're going to cut to her crying on her letter. And then we're going to cut to her face and she's going to wipe away her tears. The way this angle is shot is very ugly. Her arm movement is stiff. Her eyes look too far apart. The angle was just weird in general. There's no lighting in the scene, so everything feels really flat. It's just an ugly ending to the show, and you can tell that they were half-assing this a lot. Like, they were really rushing through it. Why did you introduce- because the volume- in the trailers, there's such dynamic lighting and shadows on the character models. And then, as this volume goes on, that it becomes less and less of a thing. And I honestly don't get why. Because, <laughs> why am I roasting her? There's just a lot of things just really, really came together, <laughs> Kelvin. <laughs> they, just, they all just really dominoed into this one moment. <laughs> the thing is, especially with their dynamic shading, I don't understand. Now that I've started to dabble with animation, I understand that shading is just a toggle. You know, but like you hit, you have your shading on or off. So they had shading in the first episode or two. There was a lot more dynamic shadows happening. So it implies to me they turned the toggle for shading off just because they wanted to render it faster, which tells me they probably were rendering this like right at the very end. Like just like volume five, they were rushing right at the very last second to get the episodes at. Thank you, Cross. Yes. Thank you, Cross. I wanted to make sure I was saying your name right. <laughs> Will you be doing Ruby OC character designs like Team Silver? For what? Like, for my uh, design shorts? I'd want to do that eventually. I want to do... I've, I have a poll on my Patreon right now, uh, which is asking people what other design short things they want me to talk about. Um, so if you want a chance to vote for that poll, check it out. I have, like, the Ruby Justice League designs. You could vote for that option. I have uh, things outside of Ruby, like Ever After High, Monster High, Has Been Hotel. Those are some options. I do want to talk about fan-made designs as well, eventually. Um, but I'll have to get there. <laughs> I'm, I have plenty of time. I'm gonna run out of Ruby uh, designs sooner rather than later. <laughs> but yeah, eventually I do want to talk about those, because they'd be fun. And they are good. What's the end credit scene in this volume? Hold on. I don't remember. Oh yeah, Armed and Ready. That's a good one. It took me a while. I didn't like it at first, but I do like it now. What is Volume 4's end credit scene? Oh yeah, we don't need to bother. Because we see it in Volume 5. <laughs> it's Crow talking to uh, Oscar in the bar. <sighs> so you, we did it! We did it! Hooray! Um, bounce back over here so you can see my full body. Yeah, we did it. We watched volume four. Hooray! <laughs> Wahoo! <laughs> um, good volume. Better volume. I complained a lot. I think it's because it's not, it's a better volume than I remember. And it's a better volume than perhaps my complaining might have implied. The problem is, it's good. But the bad parts are very bad. And they're, the bad parts are also very overpowering. Like, Blake's character arc is definitely the worst. It is the most annoying. And also it's the one that's on screen the most. <laughs> yes, legs and tail. Here, I'll move. Um, uh, I'll make Peekaboo and Flumbo invisible so you can get a better look at me. Oh, there's a pumpkin on the end of my tail. <laughs> 
not one for shoes in her new form. No, the, the claws are too sharp. <laughs> if I had, like, sandals, maybe. But you know, big old claws get in the way. <laughs> yeah, uh, volume four. It's not as bad as I might have. My ranting might have implied. It's just that Blake's arc is very, very bad. And her arc, I think, is the majority of the screen time. I'd have to... Uh, maybe I'll check. Maybe I'll open up my editing software and meticulously go through all four arcs to find out exactly how long... Oh, five. Sorry, I forgot about Oscar. To find out exactly how long each arc is. Because volume four is... I think it's mostly Blake and Blake's is pretty dang bad. It's very boring and slow. And it does like weird retcons with her character. She's a very annoying character in this volume. So, <laughs> does the pumpkin wilt and a new one grows every season? Yes. <laughs> yes, it does. And I can also carve it to have a little jack-o'-lantern face on it when it's Halloween time. <laughs> what happens as the pumpkin is removed from the tail? Then a new one will come. It will come back. It won't take that long for it to grow. It's a faster growing pumpkin. Like, it takes one or two days for it to come back. <laughs> Volume 4 is like a gross and bitter cake with some sweet and delicious cream inside of it. Interesting analogy. I can see that. I agree. <laughs> I agree. I would say it like when you get a TV dinner, like those little microwave meals, and you heat it up, and like half of it is good, but half of it is still kind of frozen. That's how I would say it. Like parts of it are good, but the other parts of it definitely needed longer time to cook. Uh, Ruby's is the longest. Ruby does wander a lot. <laughs> She just sit around and babble with Crow. That's the thing. The parts that are on screen the most, that like, that like, like take up the most screen time, is conversations that are very pointless, not very fun. It's mostly just conversations, and that's always Ruby conversations or Blake conversations, or Oscar. A lot of Oscar standing around, not really doing anything. <laughs> It's, again, it's it, this is like the beginning of a character arcs starting to happen. You know, f f out of the five character arcs, four of them is a character decides to start doing something next time. And then the other one is Ruby gets from point A to point B. And the only thing that gets in her way is there's Tyrion gets in her way and they stop him. And then the Nekalavi gets in their way and they stop that. And it's very easy. It, like, there's not a lot of... Like, like, many episodic things for them to, like, do would have helped a lot. If there were, like, different sections of the... Like, if, like, Weiss's thing wrapped up sooner, so her arc ended faster, maybe it would help. It's hard. It's just, a, like, a weird slow volume. Do I have a song I really like from Ruby Volume 4? Yes. This Life is Mine. It's my favorite. It's not my favorite Ruby song ever. It's one of my favorites. This Life is Mine. Hands down, it's the cool. It's even cooler in Volume Five because we get the like rock part when she's fighting the the bees. But it comes from Volume Four, and it's my favorite Volume Four song, hands down. <laughs> yeah, a lot of Volume Four, Volumes Four slash Five has a lot of talking, but nothing of substance is said. Yes, that's the worst thing. It's a lot of like repeating things the audience knows. You know. Like, 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 oh, we gotta get the Team Ranger caught up on what maidens are. Oh, we need to explain what th this thing we already talked about with Raven beforehand. It's a lot of nothing. It, it feels like they kind of struggled to fill their runtime. Because, like, it's 12 episodes, but I feel like this volume could have been half that. And... I, 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 it's, it's what I've been saying. I think a lot of it is like they didn't have the time. They didn't give themselves the time to have more dynamic or action-oriented events happening throughout the volume. So it's a lot of standing and talking because that's easy to do. They didn't want to start anything going because they felt like they could drag the story out. That's another thing. Like Ruby was its peak at this moment. Volume 3 was bigger than ever before and Ruby was like huge. And now they're like, oh, we can drag the story out. We can drag the plot lines out for more seasons and that'll get us more money. And, and so you get a season like volume four where it doesn't really move anything forward. I wouldn't call it filler, but it's not a lot of development. It's the barest necessities of development 
and everyone's kind of just slowly creeping forward. You know? It's a lot of saving time and money, having characters barely move, as we set up new ideas. I, I also think the biggest thing is um, they really struggled with having four different story arcs happening at the same time. Five if we include Oscar. Having five different story arcs happening at the same time as each other. I think really they weren't prepared to handle something like that. You know? Like it doesn't... The five arcs don't flow into each other very good. It's hard to really read the beginning, middle, and end. There's no conflict for half of them. There's no resolution for some of them. It's... There's no, like, rising action for a good couple of them. Bye, pretty weird duck. Thank you for showing up. <laughs> You're cool. <laughs> yeah, the, the volume four, it's just, it's weird. It's a weird one. It's kind of chill. Like, if you're in the mood to just sit down and watch people s sit around and kind of world build, because that's what the majority of it is. Like, we see Menagerie and we world build Menagerie, and then we see Mistral and we kind of world build, like, Kuroyuri and whatever. You know, there's a lot of hinting at things that could, like, kind of flesh out the world around them. A lot of beginning ideas for characters. But in the long run, it's just such a skippable volume. Like, everything they talk about, I, and I think that's the biggest thing, is the th important parts are barely in it. Like, the important parts is learning about the relics. And they have one brief expo exposition story to set up the idea of the relics, and then we don't talk about it anymore. We don't, like, have the characters speculate on it. Like, yeah, Crow's down for the count and he can't explain it anymore. But we don't have, like, Ruby asking Jean what he thinks about it. We don't have Ren and Nora being like, oh, I think this is good, I think this is bad. The characters are sitting there and having exposition told to them. And not just Ranger. It's also, like, Blake with her dad. It's Yang with Ty. It's, you know, all of them. Things are being told at them, but they very rarely get to actually react to any of it. They don't get to converse with each other about any of it. So it feels like it doesn't really matter, both to them as characters and to the story as a whole. But it's not nearly as bad as Volume 5. <laughs> We're gonna really, uh, really dive into the weeds with Volume 5. Volume 5 is horrible. Volume 5 is terrible. Volume 5 is the worst. <laughs> the worst. Like, I had a lot of complaints with Volume 4, with Blake especially. But there were also good moments. There were parts that I did like, like Tyrion. I love Tyrion. There is nothing good with Volume 5. It, it, the mistakes are obvious right from the get-go. So. Alright, I guess that's it for this stream. I have a lot more things happening this week. So yeah, like I said, tomorrow there'll be um, Patreon. Patrons will get a new video early. And then that video will be released on Tuesday for everyone. So keep your eyes peeled for that. Also tomorrow, very big, we're doing the AMV challenge thing, where we're going to be going through everyone's AMVs. I'm so excited. We're going to talk about all of them. Um, there's a playlist in my channel, my channel playlist, and also it's the pinned link comment. Oh wait, it might not be pinned anymore, because I edited it, and I might have to repin it. I also have a comment, like a linked comment, uh, with the playlist in the comments of the video announcing the AMV challenge. So, there's all of that as well. That's gonna be tomorrow, it's gonna be very exciting. And then, on volume 5, is going to be Wednesday. I'm going to be streaming volume 5 on Wednesday, it'll be a whole thing. I'm excited. <laughs> and then on, f uh, on Tuesday, I'm also doing my Team Jack stream, where I think we're finally going to be finishing up talking about Bumblebee with Volume 9. So, lots of stuff this week. And then on Friday, again, Episode 3 of Ever After High is coming out. So I got lots of stuff to do. <laughs> Tuesday this week, or next week? This week. This Tuesday. This one coming up. <laughs> lots of stuff. Lots of stuff happening this week. Ah, uh, Critter's new avatar reminds you of Nifty? Cool. I like Nifty. She's the best character. <laughs> I was actually more inspired by um, Iris from Monster High. Hell yeah. <laughs> so, lots of fun stuff. Keep your eyes peeled. Um, think, I hope you like my new outfit. <laughs> my new design. <laughs> I love it. 
So lots and lots of cool things. I'm super excited. I have to make a thumbnail, I just realized, for the AMV challenge. So I gotta, I guess I'll do that. <laughs> Thanks for showing up for this stream. Everyone who donated with Super Chats, you're awesome and cool and I appreciate you immensely. I'll see you tomorrow with the AMV challenge. I'm excited. Make sure to watch all the AMVs beforehand because everyone deserves likes and comments and love and attention. <laughs> Nice, 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 nice. Yeah, volume five this Wednesday. I'll see you all later. Okay. All right. <laughs> all right. Thanks for showing up. I appreciate you. Bye bye. <laughs>